true. It's uncut. It's unfiltered. This is the show of shows. This is the biggest names in drag racing. No holds barred. Speaking his mind. I've never had a problem expressing my opinions, but what we're doing here is bigger than that. These are conversations that need to be had in an unfiltered way. Exploring hot topics. Drag racing's all I've ever done. It's all I care to do. And spreading the gospel of drag racing. I respect the history. I appreciate how far we've come, but I want more for this sport, and I'll fight for it. This is the great American motorsport, drag racing. The West Buck Show starts in three, two, one. Hey gang, Wes Buck here, Drag Illustrated Magazine, checking in. It is Wednesday, November 30th, 2022. What's up, guys? You doing well? Guys and gals around the world, we've missed you. It's been, I think this is the biggest uh, break we've had since the show started in 2022. We're on uh, this like 40 some odd weeks in a row, something like that, episode 283. And boy, do we have an episode for you guys today. Dare I say it? Let's get the, the drinking game started now. We've got a barn burner lined up for you. In just a few minutes, we will be joined by NHRA Top Fuel World Champion Brittany Freaking Force. Following that up with the one, the only, the legendary, the living legend and icon in pro stock history, five-time NHRA pro stock champion Erica Enders. And we will round out the show, last but not least, fresh off a win at the season-ending NHRA finals in Pomona, the one, the only, Angie, Miss, Angie Smith. Uh, thank you guys. Again, I want to remind you how critical of a role each and every one of you guys play in, in this show and what we're doing for the sport of drag racing. I, I've been saying this a lot lately as I extend invitations to the 2023 running of the World Series of Pro Mod, but it, it's not just going to be me. It, it's not just going to be myself, Mike, and JT. It, it's not going to be myself and, and Drag Illustrated. It's going to take all of us to get drag racing where it deserves, where it needs to be in the landscape, in the the the, the world of sports and motorsports. So thank you for being a part of this show each and every week uh, as we we kind of round out the holiday season or at least get ready, get rid of one and get on to the next one here. I guess Christmas is right upon us. But it, it is hard not to be thankful and, and kind of look back at all that has happened Drag Illustrated at this point in time has been around for 17 years. We've been doing this show for five, six, seven years somehow, some way. And it's an incredible thing that has happened. And I really want you all to know from the bottom of my heart, thank you. All these likes, all these shares, everything, the comments, the conversation, even when I get into it with folks, it's all worth it because we are doing the Lord's work. We're doing the good work that's required to take the sport to the next level. So thank you guys all so much. Everybody that tunes in every weekend, it means the world to me uh, and two other gentlemen that I'd like to introduce now. My cohorts here on the West Buck Show, the ones, the only Mike Carpenter, JT Hudson. What's up, kids? Doing good? I've missed you. I haven't seen your your smiling faces in a couple of weeks oh, now. Like uh, yeah. it's been a moment. You saw me last week. Oh yeah, I did. I was trying to, you know. I wasn't gonna bring that up. Make it dramatic. Yeah. Good to be back, Make man. It dramatic. I, I think we deserve that break though. And we, it's not like we have anything else going on, really. I mean, you know. Yeah. yeah right. Just, right. Yeah, just, nothing at all. Just cruising into the yeah. end of the year around here, right? I hate this week. No, JT just said that, and I thought that was super I, funny. Exactly. He goes, oh, I hate this week, pre-PRI week. It's, it's and I never horrible. thought about it like that, you know? It is. It's a tough uh, week, but this has been going on for a couple of weeks. And yeah, if, but the good thing is, if, if there were a couple more weeks in between, Wes would have found 30 more things, more for things us to, to do. do. With PRI. So that <laughs> it's, it's good that we don't have any anything more than a week at this point. Yeah. I, what do I always say, Mike? <laughs> Parkinson's law. Work expands so as to fill the time a lot exactly. for it. So we started we started prepping earlier this year. And I think that's how we ended up with uh, a lot more stuff to do. Right. More shit on our plate. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. And to be honest, like I've I'm staring at page upon page of notes because even though we're about a week away from the 2022 performance racing industry trade show in Indianapolis, I, I hope to see a whole lot of y'all there. Um, the drag illustrated team will be there in full force. There's still a lot to do. I don't know about you guys, but I mean, Mike's next day, Aaron signs and posters yeah. and my JT's I'm organizing stuff with getting, the party. I mean, yeah, wow. we just need our own FedEx truck. Just get a truck warmed up at the dock and we'll load all this stuff up, man, because <laughs> it's uh yeah, we're, we always say that drag racers keep, these shipping companies and business. And now we're, we're doing the same thing. It's a fact. My uh, JT, we're, we're what? Eight days away from the seventh. Did we decide the seventh? This will be the yes. seventh. Yep. 
This is the seventh Drag Illustrated After Hours in 2022, powered by VP Racing, uh, a fantastic partner here at Drag Illustrated, and a relationship that has really developed rapidly in 2022. A great group of people that I'm very excited to have involved. What a freaking awesome dance partner for us to have for the biggest party in drag racing. JT, I know one of the last items on your list has been some custom cocktails, right? So we're working on a, what are we yeah. working on? A C16 cocktail? We're working on an M5 cocktail, I think. Yeah, I think um, C12, C14, C16, and Nitro. <laughs> I like this. Yeah. I like this. Um, everybody in the comments, if you're watching along and you haven't clicked like, if you haven't clicked share, please do so. If you're following along on YouTube, subscribe to the channel. It makes a huge difference to us. We surely appreciate it. And that way, you'll stay in the loop with everything that we drop content-wise uh, moving forward. But if you have an idea for a cocktail... Or maybe just share with us your drink of choice. Let's do that. We're headed into cocktail season, right? I mean, it's that time it, it, you kick that's, the fire. It's yeah. all Don't seasons. You think all season. It is all yeah, seasons. It yeah. is all seasons. It, it is all seasons. I, there's no it's cocktail, cocktail season. There's there's no cocktail that, shot. Yeah, JT knows all cocktail names. If you go to the bar with JT, and he just he'll just shout out these names. And I'm like, what are you? What is that? Oh, it's a no. Blah, the blah, only you know. one I've ever heard him say is the one that I hear him say the most frequently. Let's just say is Vegas bombs. Yeah, Vegas, Vegas bombs, bombs for everybody. Yeah, Get that got us. That got Vegas Indy. bombs. Yeah, yeah he yeah. gets the, the pirate voice going. The Vegas know? bombs were the, the culprit. The pirate, in, in the pirate voice has gotten a lot better since I quit smoking. I think it has. Yeah. You need to start smoking again. I know. Colorado Let's Bulldog. Start, that's, JT, that's start another, smoking. Yeah, start yeah. smoking. Yeah. yeah. You've done really good, but yeah. Let's it, just it start it back it up. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't fit. Yeah. I really oh uh, yeah. yeah Colorado Nate, Bulldog. In. Yep. Oh, Colorado yeah. Bulldog. Yeah. I I one time told a <laughs> bartender in Colorado. Do you need to know how to make that that bulldog? And she looked at me and she said, You were staying there, weren't you, Mike? Oh yeah. Because I had I drank it. Colorado two hours, I think. Bulldog. <laughs> and I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, it's so back. funny. That's another Pickle Billy. Don't you think uh, is another one that he's T? Do you have with. the colors in front of you? What's that? The drink colors. Yeah, I do. So what C12 is going to be the one that's yellow, right? Or C14? C12. C12 is aqua green. Okay. And then C14 is yellow. And C16 so C14, blue. I think, needs to be Red Bull and vodka. That's what it is. Sugar-free Red Bull and vodka. I don't know about you know, sugar free, but I like sugar vodka. free better, to be honest. Yeah. But I think that that's going to be a fun one. I have a feeling that'll be a popular drink. And you're thinking for the nitro, um, we just lost JT. The internet yeah. has gone down in Northeast Missouri. <laughs> um, I, we should probably start sending out, we ask people to check in if you're safe. Uh, yeah, in northeast is, Missouri, because there may a tornado have just, been a, just rip through there. It, it may have, but I was thinking that for M5, I think VP wants to call it Nitro. I like M5 because M5, perhaps courtesy of the Street Outlaws, has developed like a little bit of a brand name. Like yeah. it, it's a thing. People know exactly what M5 is. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, the the methanol drinks. Every drink is going to have some form of alcohol in it, right? What is not right, just yeah, the best for sure. Yeah, for sure. So no, a uh, huge shout out again, guys, uh, to everybody at VP Racing Fuels. This is an incredible team that has, when we do these things, I hope everybody uh, appreciates that it's so important to have a, a willing dance partner, someone who understands what we're trying to do, who wants to be involved and is actively involved and participates. Uh, I don't mean to like air out all of our dirty laundry, but over the course of the last several months, we've had weekly meetings with VP Racing and they have been so involved in this process. The, the amount of time and energy that they've put into this party is incredible. And, they and know. I think you'll they know see the deal because they do. The they original- get it. PRI party that sort of inspired ours was the VP party. So, you know, I'm sure there's been a lot of turnover and, and a lot of the same people aren't there, but same company owner, probably some of the same executives that green green lit that party that inspired ours. So it's cool. And it's like a full circle deal. It is kind of a full circle moment. And to have someone involved that really gets it and what to me, I thought it was a cool moment as a company for us to be having an hour long conference call about how to coordinate, uh, correlate 
fuel types to cocktails. I'm going, all right, we're doing it big here because we're on the phone with five people. We're having a video conference with five people from VP Racing Fuels talking about, all right, this <laughs> fuel is yellow, you know, so we need to do that one, you know, as like a, a, a Red Bull and vodka. And then this one's clear. So maybe we do that as a tequila shot. And to just have that conversation this had to be and, the highlight of JT's Drag Illustrated career. He was very that excited. Conference was no I mean, he, was, he was probably pumped after that. No, he was very, very excited. So uh, anyways, huge shout out to those guys. We really appreciate it. I think the amount of uh, stuff that they have shipped to Indianapolis, I mean, you talk about buying a FedEx truck, VP is sending it all. They're sending everything they have to Indianapolis, not only to be a part of the PRI show, of course, that goes without saying, but even more so to be involved in support Drag Illustrated After Hours here in 2022. I think I put a post out earlier this week that I really am anticipating a sellout crowd. If you guys don't have tickets, log on to dragillustrated.com and make sure that you snag those up. You can also go to NV Nightclub. That's I-N-V-Y nightclub.com and pick up tickets. The party again Thursday night and the huge reminder be sure to swing by the Drag Illustrated booth at PRI. We have a new location. We're no longer back uh, on the back nine yep. over there in the corner. We're right bigger up front. Booth. Shout out. Better bigger location. booth, better booth, new branding, everything better. Uh, super excited about that. But swing by Thursday morning because we do have early access badges that I think are going to be pretty important. You get into the party yeah. a full hour earlier. So instead of if not, piling up at the line in that line yeah. at nine o'clock, you're going to be able to beat that line. Hopefully, I'm hoping there's some amount of line because in the sure snow, does make for great photos we've had you know? people you know dying in the snow out in the line it's just, it, well and actually though this this new venue envy they do a great job of getting everybody through doing the whole security check doing every doing all, that whole deal so uh much more streamlined but still you want to get there early for sure it's it's difficult putting on an event in this day and age like i had someone make a post about that on social and i replied to it that Putting on events in this day and age, like post COVID or here kind of at the tail end of COVID, these are wild times. I, I you're going to look back at all the last two, three years at some point in the not so distant future and like really be blown away. I think when we reflect on what has happened and the way things changed so dramatically, so how things just got wiped out in 2020 yeah. because we were trying to calculate how many parties we've had and we and we were we thought it was eight. Or this was going to be the eighth, but we missed one in 2020. And how many things can you say, oh, no, that didn't happen in 2020. Didn't do that in 2020. You know, things that you do annually or that you're, you know, calculating how many years it's been going on. And kudos to all the people that had the out. foresight. Uh, Brett Kepner is somebody I think that would appreciate this. This next comment is how important it, it is. And it was in 2020 to have your event happen in some way, shape or form just for continuity, like mm -hmm. just so that you can say we've had the longest running X, Y, Z of all time, or we've been doing this for 50 years. Otherwise you got to stick an asterisk next to it and say, yep. we did it for 50 years, but we did take 2020 off like most of the population of the planet. But it's little things like that that are, it's mind blowing, but huge shout out to Envy Nightclub. He also owns Jason Jenkins, the owner of Envy Nightclub, also owns Tiki Bob's, which is right next door. He, he owns a bunch of venues in downtown Indianapolis, but I can't it's been you and I've been to India a couple of times this year. We went for the U.S. Nationals. We also went for the PRI headquarters grand opening. So I, I love downtown Indianapolis. It's, it's a great place, man. It's a great place. It's a really, truly special area. I can't wait Looking to get forward back to it. So what else week, we got man. going on at PRI? We've got the party. That's Thursday night. But Thursday before uh, during the during the trade show, we have a big uh, press conference, media scrum, World Series of Pro Mod. Uh, tell all q and I'm very excited about this event, Mike. And it, it's I'm excited about it because I don't really feel like anyone's ever done anything like it. And th there seems to be a lot of those things. And I know people, I've had a handful of people ask me like, dude, why are you like so wound up over this press conference? But I love pageantry and I love the opportunity to address a crowd. I love the opportunity to tell a story and, and get people together. And drag racing needs more sizzle. It needs more pomp and circumstance. It needs more pageantry. And if you look at combat sports specifically, these sons of guns in boxing and mixed martial arts, they have a press conference everybody every time someone takes a deep breath. If Conor McGregor walks outside and steps in a mud puddle, 
Boom. Lights, camera, action. We're having a press conference. Connor, shoes dirty. And drag racing needs maybe not that extreme, but it needs something along those lines. And I cannot wait for the first, what I believe will become an annual tradition, the World Series of Pro Mod Conference Thursday at the PRI show in the press conference center from 1 to 2 p.m. Thursday afternoon. We've got a handful of drivers, uh, World Series of Pro Mod drivers that will be there. Victor Alvarez from Bradenton Motorsports Park will be there. And a very special guest will be there. I'm going to plant this seed. Or well, I hope you'll or be Nate. there. You'll both will be there, I'm sure. Oh, I'm going to be, be there, there and I'm back. Kind of. You Fairly. look like you're in you're 1988. In... Yeah. Really? It's like I all love... fuzzy. That was a fun time, though. I'll take it. <laughs> 1988. You remember yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I can't remember. remember it. Yeah. No, I it's, I don't remember 1988. I was five. You know, so Same. sorry about that. JT, what were you, 24? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. JT was 25, right? I was 11. Okay, close enough. But anyways, <laughs> the World Series of Pro Mod press conference Thursday afternoon. I encourage you to be there because it's not going to be like any sort of press conference you've ever seen before. This is not some boring, uh, bright lights and everybody looking pale and slimy or something under fluorescent lights at a trade show. This is going to be an actual event that will... I think set the bar. I, I've kind of said to everybody on our team, JT and Mike have heard it a lot, but the, the goal for 2023 and for the World Series of Pro Mod is to raise the standard. It is massively important. If we want to change things, if we want to change the sport of drag racing, it, it starts with raising our standards. It, it's not enough to post on social once a month. It's not enough to email our list once every 10 days or something we have to stay in front of people nonstop. We have to be generating incite, excitement and enthusiasm around this event every single day. I don't care if it's Thanksgiving. I don't care what holiday is going on. I don't care what world crisis is taking place. We have to stay in front of people 24-7, wide open throttle at all times. We have to raise the standard. And it's my hope that we impact the sport of drag racing with this event, not just pro mod racers, not just, you know, not just for ourselves, but for the entire sport. I want to raise the standards that exist in drag racing. And it starts with the World Series of Pro Mod Press Conference on uh, what is it? Thursday, Thursday, Thursday December 8th, 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. No, East Coast time, actually. Yep. I always forget that I change time zones when I get over to Indianapolis. But anyways, going to be a huge event and more details forthcoming in the next three to five days. But we have a major seismic, game-changing, forever-changing things announcement that will happen at that press conference. So please, I encourage you guys to be there. Uh, what's our, what's our streaming online. plan? Yeah, what's our streaming plan online for that? Solid question. Um, it is my hope that it will be streaming on Flow. That's that's my hope. Uh, that, that's the idea is to have this thing streaming on Flow Racing. It'll certainly be streaming on Drag Illustrated's Facebook page, YouTube channel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I also anticipate us having some sort of presence on PRI's social network. Um, so I believe across the PR, Nancy, I think, is sorting out some of those details yeah. right now. It's honestly, it's above my page. Well, rate. that's she's actually working on the details for our other big press conference on Friday, one o'clock in the content creation zone, which I don't know if you guys, if you were at PRI last year, you saw this gigantic room hall that they had dedicated to content creation, uh, discussion and uh, education with a giant content creator stage. You and I actually spoke on that stage at one point with Johnny D, I believe his name is the, the, what's his name? The, the something cowboy. He's fantastic. He's got a yeah, great voice. I That's forget what I his know. what his uh, nickname is, but he he does a great job. We'll be doing that again, but that's where we're going to have our thirty under thirty uh, press conference this year. So, no longer in the in the overcrowded uh, press conference center because this thing is so well attended. We had to expand it, take it to a bigger stage, and I believe that uh, will be streamed by PRI because uh, they've got that whole it setup will. in there. So we'll we'll have all the details on that too, but. Uh, I want to give a shout out to everybody yeah. involved with the Drag Illustrated 30 Under 30. First and foremost, Nate Van Wagnen, uh, editor in chief at Drag Illustrated Magazine. What Nate does, he has taken this, this program on 
and really wrapped his arms around it. He pours his heart and soul into this. He cares so much about the people that that earn a spot on this list. He coordinates the effort to produce all the content, round up all the photos. I can't begin to tell you all how difficult of a task that is. Typically, every issue when we, we send one to or we get ready to tackle an issue of Drag Illustrated, you're, you're looking at one cover story, a couple of supporting features, various other items in the magazine, not to minimize it, it's, it's quite significant. But when the 30 under 30 issue rolls around, all of a sudden, instead of having maybe one person on the cover, you're going to have a handful of people on the cover. Instead of one central piece of content in the magazine, you've got 30 stories that you have to tell of varying degrees. Some are 500 or 1,000 words. Of, of doing this work is getting people on the phone, gathering up photos, and writing those stories. And when you have to do that, let's say, a handful of times in an issue, that's one thing. And then you've got to do it 30 so even if the piece may be only 500 words or so, or a thousand words, as much work went into that as a, as a 10,000 word piece. It's incredible. I think he has something along the lines of 40,000 words, maybe like that, compiled for the, the 30 under 30 feature. And it, it yeah. literally, I, I can't say it enough. Kudos to Nate. Um, I want to speak specifically about the 30 under 30, but I really need to give uh, some accolades to the entire team at Drag Illustrated. But uh, before we do... We have 29 of our 30 under 30 uh, inductees that will be on the grounds at Indianapolis. I don't know to think about what that represents, Mike. I mean, think about the flights, the hotels, like the economic impact of bringing basically 30 human beings and their friends and family to Indianapolis for this from event. All, it really across the country and around uh, the at world, least, at least one around the world. It's a it's it's a humbling thing to say out loud, dude, like to think about the fact that all these people come from all points of the globe to be here to see themselves on this list. It, it really means a, a tremendous amount to all of us. And I hope everybody there's a lot of people that are involved in this. Brett Underwood, uh, our VP of sales and business development here at Drag Illustrated, worked his tail off uh, rounding up sponsors for this event so we can do all the move to the main stage, add the production value, make sure all these people are here, uh, expand the, the coverage in the magazine, custom jackets for everybody that's inducted into the class of 2022. It, it takes an army, and I just can't say enough about this group of people and the effort and the energy that, that has gone into making the Drag Illustrated 30 under 30 what it is. So thank you guys all so much. And while I'm talking about that, and before we introduce our first guest of the day, I do want to I want to give my man here, Mike Carpenter, some credit. Mike oversaw the creation of the largest issue of Drag Illustrated that has ever been this past issue, a 164-page issue of Drag Illustrated, our 178th issue, uh, headed to PRI, it is it 79th? Yeah, yeah 179th issue of Drag Illustrated. Mike has overseen the creation of almost all of them. It's safe to say damn near all of them, dude, and, and thank you. Uh, the effort, the cover, everything about this thing looks spectacular. Yeah, it looks, it, and it's awesome, man. We always think, how are we going to top this? You know, year after year, how are we going to make this look better? How are we going to increase the page count? And we just have a hell of a team right now. And it takes it takes all aspects of it, like you said, Brad Underwood on sales, Nate on editorial design, production, uh, the direction of everything that you give us. So that's you know it, it just takes everyone. And uh, yeah, we've we we have a hell of a team here, and and we really we look do. forward to it, celebrating that at PRI. I, I'm so proud to be able to go down there with the the heftiest issue of the magazine that has ever been, and, and show this bad boy off because. It really is a coffee table piece. It's a collector's item. And to think about sending that thing to print along with, you know, a daily updated website and a daily updated email newsletter. And I mean, Josh Hatchett, Nancy Copen, what Nancy has done for Drag Illustrated cannot be overstated. Caroline putting out fires in the office all the time. JT, Van Abernathy, Kyle King, our IT guy, um, Blake Blake Fontenelle uh, producing videos, uh, Kayla, Zadell, who else am I missing? There's, I mean, it takes an army to pull this thing off uh, day in and day out, and I just feel really lucky to have this group of people around us. Josh Dixon, who has really stepped up and been a huge part of our graphic design push in 2022, actually the last several years. Mike, didn't you say this issue has the most new advertisements of all time? Yeah. I mean, a lot of times companies will uh, uh, rerun the same ad for uh, several issues in a row or for a whole year. 
but this every company almost sent 30 under 30 specific ads or PRI specific ads or something that is is timely for this issue and it kind of shows to me how seriously they take their investment with us i always like to see new ads new artwork come in because they're not just on autopilot they care about what message they're putting in front of our readers so that's always exciting to see as well it really is and and seriously for all the kids and young people that have been a part of the 30 under 30 over the years and everybody that will in the future will be in the future thank you for playing along. Thanks for being a part of it. All the companies that sponsor it. I think we had 14 companies this year step up to be a part of the, the Drag Illustrated 30 Under 30. And that's offering prizes, offering uh, sponsorship, offering uh, gift certificates, offering product. It, it's an incredible thing. And I hope that we can keep it going. because, And I know that we can because there's perhaps nothing more important than drag racing's next generation. Like I feel blessed to have this incredible community uh, thriving the way that it is here in 2022, but we've got to make sure that it continues to thrive. Make sure that we create new car guys and gals, new drag racers, new champions to be. And you'll hear me rant about this during the press conference if you attend, but drag racing will break your back. It, it'll, it'll break the bank. It'll break your back. It'll wear you out. It will test you in every way imaginable. And I think it's very important as a sport that we foster uh, these the, the the future we that we help these people understand know that we appreciate them and that they're being that we we notice we're watching we see you doing this we see you making the tough choices we see you all deciding to go to the race shop instead of the kegger right we see you going to the race uh, to the racetrack when you could be at some other event or some other endeavor we appreciate the people that are pouring their hearts into the sport of drag racing and i think it's our duty to make them know that we appreciate and validate those efforts so that's why the drag illustrated 30 under 30 exists we have a ton of other things to cover regarding the performance racing industry trade show but i'll leave you with this i hope we see you all there this event is a very very important part of our community getting people together away from the racetrack to talk shop talk business and just share one another's company be around like-minded people it's so important if you're not planning on going i encourage you to change your plans or try to be there and if you're already uh, got a flight booked to Indy and you're planning on being at the convention center next Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We, uh, myself and everybody at Drag Illustrated, look forward to see you. And I do want to remind everybody before we bring on our first guest of the day that each and every episode of The West Buck Show is brought to you by way of our friends at Stroud Safety. Stroud Safety is known for their top quality racing safety equipment from drag shoots and seat belts to fire suits, gloves, and blankets all 100% made in America. Log on to StroudSafety.com, a brand new e-commerce website that looks fantastic and works extremely well. Make sure you tell them we sent you. And a huge shout out to those guys as well for supporting the Drag Illustrated 30 Under 30. They've been a part of this for the last several years. Uh, they offer a gift certificate to every one of our Drag Illustrated 30 Under 30 uh, classmates, so class members. So thank you guys for that. And I guess, Mike, without any further ado, we, we've got a big one here. How yeah, cool is someone, it when we get to do this? Yeah, it's awesome. Someone who's very busy. And if you follow Brittany Force on social media, she's all over the country. I think she I think she drove across country. They moved, I think she moved from North Carolina back to California, drove across country, documented that on social. I think she was in she uh in the mountains somewhere like yesterday and and shooting assault rifles yesterday. So and then now she's with us. So I mean, uh, she's balling, right? She just, she's the yeah. NHRA Top Fuel World Champion. Brittany yeah. Force does whatever Brittany Force wants to do. She, hey, she's she's enjoying the time off now after after working hard all season and getting that championship. Looks like she's enjoying it. Well, I hope so. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, 2022 Camping World Drag Racing Series NHRA Top Fuel World Champion, two-time world champion, the one, the only Brittany Force. <laughs> hey, Brittany. Hey, Brittany, what's up? Hey, I like that two-time introduction. Yeah. Two time, two time, not just once, twice. And, and so, is that true, Brittany? Do you just do whatever the hell you want now that you're an NHRA two-time NHRA top fuel champion? You just are you? How are you contending with the paparazzi? Are they camping outside of the house? Is it becoming <laughs> obnoxious? No, no paparazzi. But um, <laughs> no, I, I went to Colorado. You said you follow me on social media, so yeah, for, follow, stalk, you know, same Colorado, thing. And had a great time. Just got back in town. And yeah, it kind of did it all. Went to the Glen Ivy, the not Glen Ivy, the Glenwood Hot Springs. Uh, went shooting up in the mountains. Did a bunch of stuff. So now I'm back 
here for a little while. But um, yeah, I mean, you got a vacation, right? I finally yeah, have oh, you have to. So you're it's so, so you're important. no longer in North Carolina. We were happy yeah. to claim you here in North Carolina, but you know, I guess that was just a temporary deal. Yeah, it was just a short period. I was a uh, kind of based my whole season out of North Carolina. Now I'm back here in California. Oh, really? I didn't realize that. Okay, I had no idea. Base your whole season out of North Carolina, man. Mooresville, that Mooresville, Charlotte area where Mike lives, but also really Born and becoming raised. this. I didn't just move here. Central race. place, right? I mean, for all things motorsports, it's incredible. Mike talks about it all the time. Like he goes to the grocery store, bumps into somebody that works at a NASCAR team or bumps mm -hmm. into somebody that owns a drag strip or whatever. It's it's everywhere out there. Do you like that part of the country, Brittany? I do. It's beautiful there. And you get season change, which I really love. You don't really see that much in California. But I was more in like Aberdeen and Southern Pines, which is just an awesome area. I don't know if you're familiar with yeah, that. Yeah, Rockingham Dragway right down the road. Yes, it is. Yeah. It is right down the road from there. That's a spot right there, man. <laughs> that is a real spot. I love, I've stayed in Pinehurst. I got a funny story that I'll tell at some point. I stayed with the Sheik, Cal, the, the Alanabi Sheik at a golf course or some yeah, shit. Pinehurst and, number two. Like yeah, the, Pinehurst. Yep, Pinehurst. And the major one. It was a whole scene and there are days worth of stories, uh, but not all of them can be aired out. But yeah, I love that part of the country too. I I'm curious, we just spent a minute, uh, Brittany, talking about the Drag Illustrated 30 Under 30. And I just, when you look around the sport right now, you're actually uh, an alumni, I believe, of the Drag Illustrated 30 Under 30. And what do you make of the young movement? Because there is a youthful movement happening in drag racing at all levels. Like it's always been there, but I think about, top fuel specifically. And there's a lot of young guns in that space right now that are fighting the good fight. I mean, Justin Ashley really gave you a run for his money for your money in 2022. What do you make of like the health and wellness of the sport of drag racing specifically regarding the youth movement? I know that's something near and dear your dad's heart as well. The next generation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I think it's huge. It's very important, you know, bringing the, you know, younger generations into drag racing. It just gets younger eyes on us. And, um, you know, with that younger movement coming in, they bring in social media, uh, TikTok, Inst everything that I'm trying to figure out, but I haven't exactly figured out, they're bringing that in. And I think that's, you know, kind of where things are shifting, things are moving in this, you know, younger generation. I think it's a good thing, too. I, it's exciting because I, I mentioned this earlier just about, as a sport, raising our standards. And I think that's kind of what young folk challenge us to do, right? They come in and TikTok's like second nature to them. They do it all the time. Like um, all these social media platforms. And really, there's something I've noticed about young people about, you know, for everything that can be said uh, negative about young people. Um, and cause that's like, I think people like to latch on to the millennials don't work hard, blah, blah, blah. I don't really have that much experience with that. Like we have a bunch of young people that work at drag illustrated and they're all like super motivated, smart, talented, uh, not afraid of things. And that's what I see with a lot of young people. It's easy to, to kind of fall into that trap. I think of thinking everybody under the age of 30 is like worthless and lazy or something, but it's, there's really a lot of people that are willing to do it their way. I think that there's, I see young people today with their purple hair and earrings. Everybody's willing to do their thing and like completely own whoever they are. And I think that's like a secret to success, like being yourself, your authentic self and living with the consequences. I mean, I'm sure there's, there's, you know, there's a limit to it for sure. But do you see that like young people that are just totally comfortable putting themselves out there where I think it's something that you've had to kind of develop a, 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 a I don't know, not maybe a passion for, but kind of develop that willingness. Cause we've seen you come out of your shell in these interviews and everything else. It's taken a little time. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you, you definitely see that trend of uh, very uniqueness from individuals. Like you said, the pink hair and, and green hair, whatever it is, it's just their unique style that they love and they're proud of it. And um, if that's what they love, they go and showcase it. And I remember back in high school, it was very different. Um, it was very, those are the new shoes. Every girl had those pair of shoes. There was no, everybody was wearing the same thing. And that's just what it was when I went to high school. And um, so it definitely is changing, but I definitely think it's a good thing uh, to be unique and be, you know, yourself and, and uh, be proud of that. What, what's negative about that? I don't see anything negative. I don't see anything negative about it either. I, I love it personally. So let's talk a little bit of racing. Um, we had, 
I think that this is one of the most exciting seasons that we've ever seen in NHRA. I mean, every year there's a storyline or something, but I think coming off of COVID and all the calamity that that was to see so many competitive teams, so many incredible drivers, and to see it come down to the last race of the season, it, it was like a movie. Uh, what would you like? Can you kind of take us through your headspace there going in? And I'm sure you've talked about a lot of this already, but we, I would love for you to kind of give our uh, audience some insight as to what were you thinking heading into the end of the season? There was a handful of people that had a shot. I mean, it would appear from the outside looking in, Brittany, that you were completely sure of yourself. I mean, but was that the case? Did you have did you feel like you guys were going to be able to get it done there at the end when you had to? So coming into the countdown, I mean, we had an incredible season all season long, carried that number one. We lost it for a little while, got back on top and we come right into our countdown and we've been killing it all season long. And we come right into our countdown and we just start slipping race it weekend after weekend. I want to say it was like three or four in a row where we were out in the second round and we hadn't done that all season long. I mean, all season long. And it was like right when this thing when you really need to step up your game, we happen to get lost a little bit. And it was, you know, you have those moments where you just, not that you doubt your team or you doubt yourself. It's just like, how are we ever, how are we going to be able to catch up is what it was. So we moved down and, uh, and, you know, looking at the layout of who this thing could come down to, who could be number one in the end. It wasn't just between one or two people. There was like five or six of us that it could come down to when everything reset, the points were so close, so bunched up. It could be anybody. You just needed to get through that countdown and do well. And we were struggling. So we really did turn it around um, in Las Vegas when we won the event that pushed us over only by seven points before going into Pomona. But that was enough for us that we were able to stay out ahead. We didn't win the event in Pomona, but we, you know, we gained a lot of points during qualifying number one qualifier. And then we went some rounds on race day and we were able to stay ahead uh, I believe this team, you know, all the way through from, you know, the beginning of our season to the end, coming into Pomona, I actually felt really good. I felt positive. I just had this good energy, this good vibe going in. I felt like we're going to get this thing. We're going to get right through it. And we're going to be standing with the trophy at the end of the day. And um, pretty unbelievable. Still seems surreal. I'm still kind of, you know, going back and reliving everything, but just an incredible season, not just not an incredible weekend, but season for our entire team. Very but, of them. And it, I think in fairness, it would have been a successful season no matter how things shook out. You had five wins, uh, career best, five wins in a season, seven final rounds. But let's, I think we got to touch on Vegas because Vegas, too, was when Brittany Forrest and company really reminded everybody that we're not going anywhere. Because as you said, it, it kind of looked like maybe you had, you know, we hear it all the time, peaking at the right time, getting hot at the right time. And it would have appeared from the outside that maybe you guys were going to fall victim to that, having mm -hmm. peaked at the wrong time. But you made an 89 point swing in Vegas, went from kind of outside that conversation to the central focus of the conversation and won that race at Justin Ashley goes out in E1, which was unheard of. I think the whole sport goes holy shit, this changes things. But yeah. but I think for me, the thing that was the, the coolest part of the entire deal, that maybe the whole season, was Brittany Forrest winning Vegas on a whole shot. Yeah. Can you, was can you, I mean, that moment, Brittany, you've taken plenty of heat for reaction times and you've had to hear that shit on social media. It, tell me, it had to be, I mean, I hope you were walking around Las Vegas like, on cloud nine like ah, i showed all y'all why i mean how was take us through that a little bit uh it was a you know great end of the day and and um i'll be the first to admit i've always struggled with reaction time and it's one of the toughest things about the job and when you stand outside a race car when you're sitting up in the stands or when you're standing behind one of these cars it looks so simple when you stare at that christmas tree but when you're in this thing and the pressure's on and it's a final round or first round whatever it is it is tough to stay focused and stay on your game. It's it's not easy. It's one of the toughest parts of the job. I, I feel like a lot of drivers would agree with me on it. And it was honestly going into that weekend, I knew it was on the line. We were just we we're just closing in, getting closer to that number one spot. And we our plan, um, you know, going into the countdown was we're going into Pomona, number one in points. We have to be out ahead. And we knew that we had to get that final round in order to get ahead. 
again by only seven points. So going into it, I think I was just so pumped. I was so fired, fired up. We were running well all weekend and it was, we need this win. We need to go into Pomona in the points late. And I was, I think I was just so pumped, so ready. So like laser beam focused at the same time, but also that kind of not giving a shit, like you have to be relaxed and like, I freaking got this. Don't need to stress about it. We're going to do it. And you know, went on a whole shot. I won on a couple actually this year. It's always a very proud moment for a driver, especially me, um, because there's been times where I held my team back and, you know, being able to come out on that end and give it back to the team. Uh, there's nothing, nothing better than that. I, you just made my month like that. Yeah. To hear that from you, I, we appreciate it because I think folks do need to recognize that it does look easy, right? Mm -hmm. It was one of the big kind of, I think, uh, what's the word? It's, it's something that has hindered our sport for a long time is how easy it looks on the outside. But when you've been in those moments, I mean, I gotta be honest, I, I fired up Scott Palmer's top fuel car and you were the first person I thought of, uh, mm -hmm. and not in like a stalker way, but in a, I can't believe people do this, especially young women, right? Like I, I can't believe like I, he had me whack the throttle and I thought about doing that on the ground while rolling through a puddle of water. And I thought these, oh, yeah. this, these people are, it's unbelievable. Table all the skill or talent or whatever, just the courage that it takes to hit the gas oh, yeah. in a top fuel car, like y'all and cut a light. You know, and be racing somebody and having a gazillion people watching. I mean, holy moly. I mean, I, I tip my cap to all of you. Um, but I'm curious how much there was one thing that I thought was an incredible kind of point. And throughout the season, we heard Brittany Forrest every time you were in front of a microphone. It was almost immediate. David Grubnick, Max Savage, this team, my guys, my group. And I know you guys spend a lot of time together. You go for dinner together. You hang out. It's not just at the races. It's not just a job. It's not a nine to five. It's a, it's a family that you guys have developed. How proud are you of delivering David Grubnick his first world championship? Uh, well, let's start there. How, how much does that mean to you? I mean, it's one thing to win for yourself, but when you win for the family, it's different. It is. It's huge. And, and you know, looking at my entire team, uh, it was just me and one other crew guy that have won a championship before. So wow. pretty much top to bottom, it was the first championship for all of us. And that's just huge. It's the one thing you're out there chasing. Uh, you know, Max Savage has been out here um, in the position he's in, chasing one for 22 years. Wow. And David Drumnick, he, you know, drove top field for years and then moved into a crew chief position. So that's huge for him to win as a, you know, crew chief. Coming into a whole new role and being able to win just a few seasons later, Um to be able to do that together, it's it takes all of us. It's every single one of us to get it done. But again, it's everybody pulling their part. I mean, doing the best that they can and bringing it every single run. Because the second one of us slips, it's it's done for all of us. And that's what's so tough about drag racing. There's no doubt. Take me through the... F I mean, I've got some stats here in front of me, Brittany. And I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but... You, you guys were number one qualifier 10 times this season. Uh, you set 16 individual track records this season. Uh, you made the fastest run in track history at 12 different facilities this year. Uh, you made the fastest run of all time in St. or in Pomona 338.94, which came after breaking your own record in St. Louis. Um, you own 25 overall track records. Uh, made all 10 of the fastest runs in top fuel this year, now has the 11th, the 11 fastest runs in history. When you have a car that runs like that, like it's one thing to have a hot rod every once in a while or feel like you've got a handle on it, but I'd love to know like what it does for your psyche and your confidence knowing that pretty much 99 times out of 100, anywhere Brittany Force goes, you have the fastest car in the property. Thank you. Um, it's awesome. It's where we want to be, but it also puts a lot of pressure on the driver. And that comes into play reaction times. You got the best car out there. And sometimes it's like when you go into, you know, race day, you know, you have your number one qualifier. You've laid down runs every single, every single lap. You have the car that should win. And then this mental thing comes in of, oh, the driver could be the one that screws it up. Like we have everything else laid out. Everything's perfect. So there again is that, that extra added pressure. But again, it's it like I said, I always say it takes all of us. We all have to bring forth, you know, the best effort we can, not just on race day, but you know, qualifying start to finish of the weekend. 
And um, I forgot what your initial, what your question Just like was. what, how, how does it, how much confidence does that give you knowing that you've got oh. the fastest car? Because yeah, there's obviously added pressure, but you've got to go up there with a little pep in your step knowing that it doesn't it's, matter who's over there. We're going to outrun them. It's David Grubnick. I mean, since I started with him in 2019, he's been delivering track records. Um, you know, we hold the mile per hour national record, the ET national record. We all of my records, like I've, I, I, it's all of us as a team, and it's it's David Grubnick right there. He said since day one, no balls, no glory, and he chased those <laughs> numbers to him to see that number up on the board and, and know that we made history. You know, at a racetrack is not just huge for him, but it's it's huge for all of us. Now we all hold that together, and it's pretty cool to. Like we, we set the, you know, uh, mile per hour record this year um, in St. Louis. And then it was pretty awesome. We did it in Pomona. And that to me is going to be forever just a big one because it's my home racetrack. And so now we leave Pomona. We have that, you know, mile per hour national record there. And I'm hoping it won't go away. I'm hoping we can keep it there because that's a special one. It's my home track. It would. What do you think? Do you guys have conversations? And I have a couple other ones, but I'm bouncing around now. Uh, do, 340 seems very doable. Is, is that a conversation that you guys have? Is that like a thing that you guys want? I mean, is that something that's on your vision board, Brittany? Like, I want to be the one? I think if we hit 340, I think we'd have an, a lot of eyes in our pit figuring out trying to know <laughs> what the hell we're doing. I but think you already have that, perhaps. <laughs> 38.9 is good. I will stick with that. I don't need to go much faster because when you're going that fast, I mean, you could freaking tell it's hauling from, you know, half track all the way to the end. And then it's suddenly, oh shit, I better get my shoots out because that, that sandbox is coming up very quickly. Especially in Pomona. Like, <laughs> I mean, if somebody steals it from me, I'll definitely want to try to see if we can get past that. But right now I'm good with our 338.9. Uh, it's, I think all of us would, would wear that badge of honor for quite a while. Brittany, what, when you look forward, I mean, I'm just, did any of this, whenever you dived into top fuel and I know that you've got a competitive streak that you likely couldn't shake if you wanted to, that's from your father. And, uh, when you see all that he has accomplished, but was this ever on your radar, like being a, a two-time world champion, uh, winning all these races, setting all these records, was it ever... I mean, because honestly, your resume is going to very quickly start looking like that of your father's, who is identified as the greatest of all time. I mean, he's all of our hero. I mean, was that ever on your radar, like personally, as your kind of your plan? Um, coming into the sports, it definitely grew in that direction. I mean, when I started in 2013, it's the only thing you're wrapping your head around is, you know, getting your first round win. And then it's your, your first win. And that is huge. And it's, yes, championship is the ultimate goal, but you, you got to start somewhere first. So like, as I've grown, you know, over my, my rookie season was 2013. And, and as we've advanced me as a driver, um, you know, different teams coming in and now this David Grubnick team, uh, we've really grown. And, and yes, my, my standards have grown with it. I want more. We want more wins. We want, uh, I told you in Indy when, when I was on your podcast with my dad, we won another championship. We did it in 2017 and that is now the ultimate goal. Um, you know, championships, that's what we race for. That's what we love. And, uh, you know, there's no better feeling than winning. No doubt. Tell me about the people that support this because it's, it, it, you, you guys have, you fly a couple different colors throughout the course of the season. It was so cool to see the whole team from Monster Energy down on the starting line there losing their minds when you won the championship. Can you give us a little bit of a background on the people that surround you? Flavor Pack, I know, is a big supporter. Monster Energy, as we just mentioned. Tell me about this group of people that have rallied around Brittany Force to get you to where you're at today. It really takes, you know, it really takes everybody to make this thing go. I mean, everybody at John First Racing, it's not just my team, but it's it's everybody at John First Racing from PR to marketing to our fab shop guys to Lanny, who's, you know, laying out on the racetrack. I mean, it, it takes so many people to make this whole thing work and especially sponsorships. Um, I'm very lucky. I've been with Monster since 2015. They're, I'm proud to wear their name. I'm proud to race for them and bring them home a championship this year. Flavor Pack's the new one that came on just in... Uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, Flavor Pack with Frank Teagues. He's also the man, um, you know, that oversees the Montana brand, uh, Austin Prox, my teammate's car. So it, it takes everybody to make this thing work. And again, um, you know, proud to deliver them a championship. 
Well, you certainly did, Brittany, and we're we're proud for you. We're proud of you. And it's I said to some folks that work with NHRA involved, like I don't know that they could have gotten any luckier to have someone like you be the the champion for the NHRA because you're you're fantastic on camera. You're an incredible ambassador for the sport, and we we genuinely appreciate it. We can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, is there any chance we get you to PRI? Do do you go to the PRI yeah, show? We'll be there. Yes, we will. You be there? Oh, you've probably got six days worth of appearances. I mean, you're the reigning, defending top fuel world champion. We will be there. I don't know my schedule yet. Um, Sarah knows, but we're, we'll definitely we'll, just, Friday. just Friday. We're there all day Friday. Okay, fantastic. There is a place that you and Sarah need to be on Friday afternoon. So I'll shoot you a text, okay? okay? But hey, thank you so much for being a part of this. Send our best to the to the fam, uh, and congratulations, Brittany. We really we couldn't ask for more. So keep it up, and we'll see you at the drag strip. All right? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Brittany. Oh my goodness, guys! I hardly know what to say about this. Sometimes that we get to an interview and have like shoot the shit with all these people, and they like talk real with us, Mike. I mean, I saw Mike in the green room. Brittany dropped her first shit of the episode and you immediately started. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's what it's about, man. It's about real, it open up and be real. Yeah. And she's done a great job with that every time we've had her on. Well, and I felt bad because we probably could have talked for like two hours. I really, we could have went into like hotel conversation, um, you know, favorite type of assault rifle, which was kind of on my, in my notes to do yeah. next. What's your favorite assault rifle, Mike? Man, I don't know. You, are we talking brands or just no? Just, just like model? style. I'm an. I'll I'll go first. I'm an AK-47 guy. I really okay. am. Yeah, like you, you can drop be. an AK-47 down a flight of stairs, bury it in sand, throw it in the ocean, pick it up, jack around in it, and it's gonna fire. I don't know. I have to pull up Call of Duty and run through all the oh, model yeah. numbers there. But AR-15, you know, is is the go-to for everybody. Yeah, that's a go-to. That's such a that's like such a mainstream news. H K M P five. I knew JT was going to yeah. bring the Navy SEAL type of, yeah. of, of deal to the table, MP5. That's a go-to in Call of Duty, MP5. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, man. Gun. What about I'm, – I'm so glad you ran through those record numbers that Brittany set this year. Just reading through that, it's incredible. It's absolutely mind-blowing. Not only the wins, not only the championship, but these these track records. It's I mean, she pretty much – has every record in top fuel at every track. I think it's cool because when you're someone like when you're in the force family, I cannot imagine the pressure you would feel to, you know, to live up to what your dad has accomplished and to operate in that shadow. I mean, 16 time world champion, all these iconic moments. I mean, he's pretty much a part of every highlight reel in the history of drag racing and having to like, measure yourself against that daily but then to not only have to measure yourself against it, but to be doing it, right? I mean, that list, when I ran through that list, Mike, 16 track record, I mean, that's full stupid. Like, that is <laughs> absolute, who owns the 25 overall track records, uh, owns 25 overall track records. I mean, that is absolutely insane. Made all 10 of the fastest runs in top fuel history. I, I, that is rare air as a drag racer. And I think that she just really deserves like every ounce uh, of accolade and kudo that we can give her. Yeah. And it's interesting too. In, and you brought that up in your, in your interview that she was the one, she was going to go teach school. Right. And, yeah, or, man. you know, she was going to be the one that wasn't going to drag race. And here she is well on her way to having the, the most successful career out of the three, four sisters that, uh, you know, certainly no knock against the other two that have competed at the professional level and they both had success, but not to the level that she's having. So she was almost the reluctant one at first because she wanted to kind of pursue a different path, came into it a little bit later and is just racking up wins and records. So pretty impressive to see. I don't think that there's any telling where this ends because you think about Britney's like coming into her own. Like I think she's in the prime of her career right now. And over the course, this isn't a train that I think is going to be derailed anytime soon. And it's going to be fun to watch because I think in other sports, like in stick and ball sports, you guys were you know, more so experts on this than I am. But you start to have conversations around how important it is to keep this group together. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Like, so you've got, like, I saw a comment in the, in the comments here about, are they going to be able to keep the, keep the entire crew together? And you start having 
because that's going to become part of the conversation. Like, can they keep this group of people together and can they build on this? Uh, our next guest, I think, is a, uh, is a perfect example of what comes from continuity and yep. keeping a group of people together for a long period of time and what can come from that. I mean, think about some of the stick and ball examples, like the Golden State Warriors, right? If you, can you keep that core together? The Kansas City Chiefs, can you keep that core together? You know, can you keep there is these no core people? There. Yeah, just there is no dude. core. It's just two dudes, basically. Yeah, two <laughs> but, dudes. So we'll go. You know, <laughs> but, but I think you yeah. get my drift. <laughs> but but you can have success without that. I mean, Brittany said there that her and one other crew member were the only ones that remained from her first championship. So that's that is impressive in itself too that they're taking an all new team. They've got a gel and and they've been able to do that. And like you said, our next guest probably has the most continuity amongst any team, maybe in all the professional ranks. I would Absolutely. like to think so. And I tell you what, before we we bring our next guest on the show to continue this barn burner episode of the West Buck Show, I want to remind all of y'all that each and every episode of the West Buck Show is brought to you by way of our friends at Redline Synthetic Oils. Redline has a reputation with racers and hardcore enthusiasts for creating products that perform and protect better than any on the market. They've been doing it since 1979. Whether it's your race car, your tow rig, your motorcycle, or your lawnmower, when you think about lubricants, you need to think about Redline. For more information, log on to redlineoil.com. Make sure you swing by their booth at the Faster approaching PRI show in Indianapolis. I know Mark Beatty, the entire team at Redline Oils will be there to uh, answer questions, shake hands, kiss babies. Guys, this is a big one. We always get excited anytime we we have the opportunity to have the champ, 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 champ on the show. Champ. Ladies and gentlemen, Another let's give female it up. Champ. Another female champion for the one, the only, five-time NHRA Pro Stock champion, living legend, perhaps the greatest to ever do it, Erica Enders. What's up? No. Five Woo! times. What's going on? Five Hi times. guys. Five <laughs> times. Uh, that was a hell of an introduction. Thank you, Wes. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. It's uh, I can record it for you if you want me to like send it to you so you can set it as your ringtone. Yeah. Yeah, right? that would be good for bad right. days. I just hit the playback. <laughs> what would be cool is if you're like sitting at a Mexican restaurant and then all of a sudden your phone rings and it's like five time, five time. <laughs> now, I, hey, we we should probably do that. Anyways, Erica, it's been too long. Uh, we, we were hoping to get with you uh, immediately following uh, all things happening. You're traveling around doing world champ stuff. So no biggie, but congratulations. Uh, what an accomplishment. Uh, what a season. I don't even know where to begin. Crazy. Uh, uh, when you, I think when you look up uh, kicking ass and taking names in the dictionary, your photo <laughs> is going to be immediately opposite of it. Uh, considering all you've accomplished, E, take us through 2022. I mean, is this a career defining i mean did you ever imagine this level of success i i had always hoped for it uh, i'm not yeah. sure i imagined it but you know the way that we started this season off you and i and, and a bunch of others have talked about it uh at the 2022 winter nationals in pomona we won the 900th pro stock race and i made a offhand comment saying there was going to be no more nice erica and that was the foot we started the season off on and we just battled it out all year long. I feel like we had an amazing season. I hate the word epic, but I feel like that's also the only word to describe it. And having said that, I feel like we also left a couple of things on the table. So could have, should have, would have been better, but to win 10 events in our fifth world title um, in one season is pretty amazing. And it's, it's all because the guys that stand behind me and I couldn't be more thankful for that group. Could, could have been better. Oh my goodness! I uh, yeah, you're. I don't okay, know well, about that. I mean, <laughs> being the perfectionist that I am, like okay. for starters, losing first round in Gainesville on a whole shot while setting the pro stock world record, not just for EFI era but for carburetors as well. That was a pretty uh, pretty low blow. <laughs> um, and we bounced. You were back really from that. mad about that deal. Like you I were was like pissed. Super pissed. Yeah. Because it was my fault, and I don't, I can't even explain to you what happened. I, I guess I was making a sandwich before I let the clutch out, but it was uh, not my proudest moment. But we were able to set the world record, and that's what the the light shined on instead of my whole shot loss. But we battled back from there. I think we won three or four events in a row following that that whole shot loss. So usually, when I perform poorly uh, personally, I, I come back and and I'm better and stronger than ever. So those are the moments that you. They have to be able to rebound from. And then our catastrophic engine failure in Bristol uh, against my teammate, Aaron Stanfield, who shook the tires that round. Um, but the most smoke ever in the history of race car driving for me, aside from that from tire in Norwalk. Um, there, were, there were just a couple, you know, and uh, 
but it's okay. And then I lost in the finals uh, at, at the world finals in Pomona uh, to close the season out. So, but it was really cool for Greg Anderson to be able to get that win uh, as Ken Black announced his retirement. So to, for him to be able to hang his hat on a high note was pretty cool. I, you know, it's funny you say that because as, sh- as I'm sure that was extremely like difficult in the moment, but it did feel somewhat storybook for Greg Anderson and that to see that Ken Black chapter kind of come to an end uh, and go out on a high note, like you said, it was incredible. But I think about th- the people that we it, that we talk to routinely, like in our business, we're talking to racers all the time that are Brittany Force just mentioned this, like initially when you start out in your pro drag racing career or whenever you decide to like take it seriously. And that doesn't, you don't have to be in the pro ranks. I mean, you could be racing your local trophy shootout, but have decided that I'm going to pursue this and you're, can I get one round win? Can I get three round wins? Can I get a race win? And I'm looking at your stats from 2022, Erica, your your win loss record, you won, you were 55 and nine. I mean, you think about how many people want to win a round of racing. Want, are celebrating winning five, are celebrating winning 10. You were 55 and nine. You won 10 races, went to 13 final rounds in nine races. Does it ever, was there ever a moment this season where, and this isn't like a trick question, but I, just as a human being, is it hard not to kind of become numb to that level of success that it's like a foregone conclusion? 13 finals out of 19 races. I mean, the fact is you're going to the final more often than not. Like on a Sunday morning, did you ever catch yourself going, all right, it's not, it's not a pre, it's not predetermined. I'm not going to the final. I got to stay in this. Yeah. I I mean, you definitely have those thoughts and there are those Sunday mornings when I don't feel like I could tie my shoes properly, let alone get in a pro stock car and dominate. So, um, it's all, it all goes back to positive mental attitude and visualizing exactly what you want. And all of those things are way easier said than done as you and I have talked about in the past, but um, the season was tremendous. And yeah, I guess sometimes it's, it's, I wouldn't say easy, but um, routine to get in that, just that element of, okay, well at four 30, we're taking winter circle pictures and then we're getting, <laughs> we're going back to Winniewood, Oklahoma. Like, I had to, I wanted to strangle Richard a couple of times this year because he's in such a damn hurry to get out of the winter circle and get on the jet and get back home for what? I have no freaking idea. But I'm like, listen, Linda, when we first started this deal, we wanted to qualify. We wanted to win a round. And now we're like, okay, well, we just won the race for the fifth time in a row. Like, whatever, let's get on the plane and go home. I feel like you have to enjoy those moments because we've been in the situation before where like go back to 2014 and 15, we won back to back world championships. And then we switched to the Dodge and we didn't win a race the entire 2016 season. And had there been more than 16 cars on the property, we probably wouldn't have qualified for a lot of those events because we were just, we were just that terrible and behind the eight ball. But um, those valleys make the peaks so much more worth it and enjoyable. And you have to remember the struggles to be able to enjoy the successes. So um, I feel like God kind of jerks the rug out from under you from time to time to just remind you to be humble and remind you where you came from and what can happen. So um, yes and no, Sunday mornings are, are tough sometimes, but you always have to expect what you want. You have to believe what you want. And at the beginning of this year, um, my family and I always sit down on January 1st and we write out our goals for, for different areas of our life, faith, uh, vocation, job, uh whatever, personal, there's seven different areas. And we write them out this year. My goal was to win five events. And obviously the world championship is on my goal list every year, but it's not something that we expect, obviously, because the competition is so stout. So I felt like five events would have been a, just a tremendous season. And we were able, able to go out and double that and win one more than the most number of events in my, in a one season, in one season during my career. So we won nine and 15. We were able to win 10 this year. Long answer to your question, but yeah. No, but it's bananas. I mean, 43 career wins, uh, quickly closing in on, on 50 and your fifth championship tied you with, with Jed Coughlin and Greg Anderson, um, one behind the legend, the professor Warren Johnson. What's it like to even hear your name mentioned, uh, amongst those people? I mean, holy moly, you talk about, (laughs) I mean, the best and the goat and all these things get thrown a lot, thrown around a lot in this age we live in. Um, but to be mentioned alongside those people, is that hard to believe? Is that exactly as planned? What, what, what's Erica Ender's thought on being on that pro stock Mount Rushmore? 
Uh, it's, uh, it's hard to believe. I mentioned it in my championship speech. As a kid, I couldn't have fathomed my name being mentioned in the same sentence with those guys, let alone um, having being in the same vicinity of, of number of world championships as them. So it's, uh, it's pretty unbelievable. And honestly, like, if you go back, the first seven years of my pro stock career were winless. And when I joined Elite Motorsports in 2014, I had six pro stock wins. So 43 minus six is what I've won here in all five world titles in just nine years. Um, if you throw the Dodge year out in eight years, we won five championships. So I think it's uh, it's definitely awesome. It's a dream come true. And, um, you know, the sky is the limit. Is it, it, we've got sponsors that are are coming on board with us. Our same loyal partners are staying on board with us. So it's kind of just like, one of those dream deals where my entire career I wished for partners like I have now and I've wished for on track success like we have now and it's it's just pretty unbelievable and I'm really I'm really blessed Wes. it's pretty cool it's an awesome thing to have uh, been able to have a front seat front row seat to Eric uh, whenever you talk about the the guys that stand behind you I know some of them are watching along right now um, but I think about Richard Freeman Royce Lee Freeman Robert Freeman Chase Freeman Casey Freeman, I mean the entire Freeman clan but but Mark Ingersoll I'd love to talk a little bit about Mark Ingersoll Jake Harrison Rick Jones Rick Jones back in action this year we saw Rick take uh, a season or so off in the midst of the COVID uh, craziness and whatnot and, and focus on business and family, but you really do have a powerhouse program, not to mention all your teammates uh, in the, the men and women that surround those camps, but take me through that, that family close knit vibe and how it translates to the success you guys have on the drag strip. Absolutely. Like we have just the best group of people, people in the entire world. And you mentioned the entire Freeman family, most most of the guys that work here have the last name of Freeman. And, you know, I enjoy my time in Houston. I call it my Freeman free zone. And as much as we joke about that, it's, it's a family deal here. Like Richard's mom, we call her Mimi grandma. She cooks dinner for the whole gang every once in a while. And we go down to her house. It's just, it's so nice to be able to have like that comfort zone and, and be able to be yourself and not always, you know, button down collar penny loafer business type deal it's it's just it's family we go on vacation together we hunt together we fish together we race together <laughs> we eat and drink together so it's just a it's a pretty awesome environment to work in and then you go down the list to Mark Ingersoll um you know I talked a lot about him too in my speech that he means the world to me I I have looked for men like him and Rick Jones my entire career it is so nice to be able to get in the cockpit of that race car, they shut the door and I'm able to focus on what I, what I do best. And that's driving usually. <laughs> and, um, I'm not having to worry about if my car is safe to drive, if they're trying to snake my position as a driver, which I dealt with in the past. Um, if they're stabbing me behind in my back when I'm not looking like these guys, I know no matter what, when I turn around exactly where they're going to be standing and Mark Ingersoll is, is one of the greatest men as well as Rick Jones. They're, Dad said I'd be lucky if I could count on one hand the people that I can trust. And Rick and Mark are, are two of those five, and my dad and sister are the other two. So if that tells you anything about what I feel uh, for those men, it's, it's pretty substantial. So they uh, they want to win as much as I do, and I didn't know I'd ever meet somebody like that. And um, their work ethic is beyond anything you could ever fathom. And I'm just I'm, – I'm really fortunate, and we, we have a whole bunch of fun together. It, seeing Mark Ingersoll like tear up during your your championship speech, I don't know that if you've seen that, uh, but you're giving your speech and uh, he's getting choked up and knowing how you know rough and tumble Mark is, you know, and fired up it, to see him get emotional. It's just a reminder of how much this stuff means, and I think it's good for everybody because. Drag racing, a lot of the glory goes to the driver, right? It's much like football where the quarterback gets all the glory yeah. and all the girls maybe. But it, it, without <laughs> those offensive linemen, right, or those defensive players that are getting the ball back, like you, you're screwed. You know, and drag racing is so similar. I have people all the time like challenge me about whether or not it's a team sport. I think it's perhaps one of the most significant team sports because like, if you go up there, like if TJ Coffin goes to the starting line and the clutch isn't zeroed or the tires got one's got more, a quarter pound more air in it, the other. I mean, there's so many ways to screw it up. So many ways to screw yeah. it up that it's like the ultimate team sport. One of the conversations we were having right before we brought you on, Erica, was about 
how important continuity is. So do you guys labor over? I know that Chase Freeman is is moving up in the world at Elite Motorsports and is going to be, you know, overseeing perhaps a, a program or a car of his own. Does are those things that you that kind of come into your mind like, oh man, we got to keep the crew together. We got to keep the team together. We've got to maintain that continuity. Or do you have like so much faith in the group that it'll be however it's going to be? Um, I do have a lot of faith in the group. My my core group of guys that actually work on my car is going to be changing next year with Chase moving up to the crew chief lounge. But he still bleeds team red and he'll absolutely be a part of it. Um, in essence, a car chief on my car. So um, and then, as you mentioned, overseeing some some of our other programs with the Quadras. So uh, I know that he's really excited about it. He's uh, he's a goofball, but he's he's super smart and very talented. And uh, I'm excited for for that next chapter in his life. So, yeah, my my group will be changing a little bit, but uh, absolutely the continuity. I was listening to you talk to, to Brittany about that, but it's so important. And we've had we have our same core group here that we started with in 2014 minus one person. So um, it's very important. And it goes back to that family deal like it's n- nobody is more important than the next guy. It's not about the engine engine builder. It's not about the crew chief. It's not about the driver. It's all of us swimming in the same direction at all times and having each other's backs. And that's not to say we don't go go to blows behind the scenes and, and have our arguments and, and want to kill each other, but um, we're united and, and that's what that's what's important about it. So I, I feel like um, we absolutely have the best group in the world. And uh, again, I'll say it again, I wished my whole career for a group of guys like this. And it's so important. Like you, you relate it to football. It's absolutely spot on. It's absolutely a team sport without my line. I'm nothing. So while yes, they shut the door and it's up to me and I'll experience whatever's coming at me before any of those guys, whether it be tire shake, no clutch, um, you know, you blow the back window out, the car turns hard, right. And tries to mow the Christmas tree over. It doesn't matter. Like they prepare the best that they can for me. They shut the door and they give the, they give the reins to me for six and a half seconds and I do the best that I can for them. So absolutely a team sport. And without my line, I, I can't do anything. So i um, super thankful for them. It's an incredible team that you guys have compiled. Uh, what do you make of the future? I mean, it's it's looking like seven, eight pro stock teams, uh, considering how at different times there's been a fairly like ominous kind of uh, vibe around pro stock. Like it wasn't that long ago that everybody was kind of putting a nail in the coffin that this deal was that ship had sailed and it was going away, but it has had an incredible resurgence and doesn't seem to be losing any momentum anytime soon. New sponsors, as you mentioned, coming into the program, expanded operations, seeing people doubling down on their commitments, new owners. Uh, like when you look at pro stock right now, are these exciting times for, for Erica Enders? Yeah, I definitely think it's exciting. And, you know, what what Richard and and Jason Line and Greg Anderson did for Pro Stock and being able to uh, grow the class again, when we switched to EFI, there were a whole bunch of rule changes in addition to EFI that were pretty cost substantial. And, um, you know, you saw the number of entries dwindle and we all lowered the cost of, of engine rentals and, um, you know, even drug extra cars out there and flew in drivers just to have 16 cars out there. And, you know, it, there absolutely is a resurgence and the people that want to yap their lips online about how pro stock's dead and it's the Camaro Camaro stock or whatever the crap they say, like, they have no skin in the game. They have nothing invested. And, and what we've all done for this class is pretty amazing. And I think it's just, it's just the beginning. Like you see all of the young blood. When I first started racing pro stock, I got my license in 2004 and debuted in 05. I was the youngest person by like 20 years. I competed against a, an entire class of middle-aged men. It was like your golf club at a country club. You know, there were no women allowed and it was, and I was a kid on top of that. And now you, you fast forward 20 years and it's all kids. And then me and Craig Anderson. So it's, it, the landscape has definitely changed. And um, the mindset's a little different than it used to be back in the day. They they enjoy instant gratification and write a check and they're able to run at the front. And it's not about what it used to be about, but our class as a whole is is pretty amazing. And, and I'm really proud of it. And you mentioned the seven cars that we have now. Of course, myself, TJ, Bo Butner and Aaron Stanfield are the four elite cars and the three quadra cars. Um, a gentleman from Lindsay, Oklahoma named Jerry Don Tucker um, he raises top sportsmen. He's going to come out and race pro stock some next year. Um, we might have another guy coming back for a little bit. 
Um, there's just a lot of exciting things happening. And with Ken Black retiring and Jim Wiley purchasing KB and all of those things, uh, you think about it. Well, if we have eight cars and KB has five, like they're <laughs> like the Magahas and whoever, Alan Prezinski and Kenny Delco, they're going to be they're going to be trying to qualify, you know, trying to go for like the 12th, 13th, 14th position if the elite and KB cars uh, manage to stay where they're at in the field. So it's uh, it's pretty crazy. And I'm really proud of uh, the number of cars that we're going to have. You mentioned no women allowed. And I think that's kind of an interesting <laughs> thing because that's so true. I mean, I remember like the penny loafers and the cigars. It was V Gaines and Troy Coughlin and so on and so forth. And it has changed pro stock, all of drag racing, but pro stock specifically has changed so much. But that no women allowed, think about drag racing, like how far things have come. We have two female champions. Like we were joking this morning, like this whole show is women drivers and it's really, it doesn't feel that unusual. Are you proud of that? Because I remember multiple times you've said to me, I don't want to be the best female race car driver of all time. I want to be the best race car driver of all time. I don't care. But do you think that we're becoming desensitized to that? Like it's becoming less of a storyline. Like it's not a huge surprise for Brittany to win. It's not a huge, huge surprise for Angie to win. It's certainly not a huge surprise for you to win. Uh, it's becoming more. Are you proud of that? The progress that we have made as a sport? Because I think it's a big deal that I'm maybe just now realizing that it's really not that big of a deal, right? For a woman to win a race. I mean, it is, don't be wrong, but it's not unusual. It happens quite frequently in drag racing. Yeah, it absolutely does. And I think that's something that's so cool about our sport is, you know, the the path in which NHRA has provided us to excel from junior drag racing to the Lucas Oil series, um, and then into the pro ranks, like you get to compete on the same stage that the pros do as, as a kid. And uh, it, it's a pretty neat deal. But um, yeah, I, I definitely feel like the women thing is kind of going by the wayside. Of course, I mean, you know, having said that, you always get the stupid comments and the, the ignorant people that feel otherwise and, and the chauvinistic people that um, are stuck in the 70s or 60s. And, you know, being as close as I am to Shirley Muldowney and, and seeing what, you know, hearing what she went through and seeing how it's affected her as a human these days and knowing, you know, what myself and Angel and um, I was texting with Alexis DeJoria earlier talking about taking a girl's trip. Like, I mean, it's, it's a really cool fraternity, if you will, um, of females and, and they're all, um, they're all successful and they're all smart and intelligent and great drivers and riders. And I can't tell you, I know it's a little side note, but I can't tell you how proud I am of Angie Smith and, she has battled her way to the top and she works her tail off and she deals with Matt. I love you, Matt, but she, uh, she's hands on and she, uh, she earned it. She really, really earned it. And I'm really proud of her. And she battled for that, for that championship this year and to try to finish one, two with her husband and won the Pomona event. I mean, yes. So I could talk about this forever and I'll shut up, but I'm, I'm really proud of the majority of women that we have out there that, um, that we're, we're doing so well. It's a, it's fantastic. It's fantastic for our sport. And it is something that I don't know that as a whole that we're as proud of as maybe we should be. You think about all these other sports and I mean, there's no, I don't see a, a world in where a female quarterback is going to trot out onto the field at an NFL game. Right. I mean, we celebrate, it's a big deal when there's a female ref. Yeah. Right. Yep. But uh, to think about a sport that provides men and women of all ages, uh, young, old, everything in between every race, creed and color to go out and do battle on a level playing field. It really is. I, I get mad about it because I, I <laughs> my drag racing is the great American motorsport. This sport deserves more than it gets, uh, perhaps for no reason other than the one I just outlined. I mean, I don't know yep. that that happens anywhere else. I, I really don't. I don't think it does either. And I love how much you love it. I think that's awesome. Well, well that's true. I'm just a psychopath. But anyways, Erica, <laughs> um, so <laughs> so wh where do you go from here? I mean, there were rumblings that maybe we may be seeing the end, you know, they're early in the season. And anytime you make a post that can even remotely be interpreted as moving on, that's immediately what everybody says. Like, oh, that's the end. She's done. And I do think that there were people who believed you could bookend an incredible career five-time world champion. You're in rare air. What more is there for you to accomplish? But I can sense in your behavior that that's clearly not the plan. Uh, we've got more to do. I mean, what do you think? I mean, are we going for six next year? Is I don't know what you guys, you're going to have to get with Courtney and kind of get thinking caps on for the hashtag because drive for six isn't as good as drive for five. So no, we're going to have to come up with something else. 
<laughs> we'll definitely have to come up with something else. But yeah, as, as long as I'm doing it, uh, I want to be the best. Like you mentioned, I, I made that comment. I want to be the best race car driver there ever was. And that is is always on the forefront of my mind. And it's um, I take a lot of pride in my driving. And, you know, I am I am the human element involved in all of this. So we we all have our off days. Right. And days that we're not proud of and scorecards that we turn in that we don't love. But um, in the whole grand scheme of things, we've we've done a lot of really great things. And I mean, it kind of was my plan to be done at the end of this year. And and I'm not sure I, I really want a personal life. I, I want I want it all right. I guess I'm being greedy, but I don't you know, when you see women that are successful in their careers, they always lack in a, in a different area. And I want to have it all. So somehow I'm going to figure out how to do that. I hope uh, if that's the good Lord's plan. But I do. I want to go home and I want to, you know, I don't know what I want, Wes. I want a, I want a husband and a family one day, and I we'll see what happens. But I love pro stock racing, and we collectively are really good at it. And um, I don't I don't guess it's time to to turn in the final scorecard yet. So we're gonna we're gonna go slit their throats some more next year and see what happens. Well, hey, we we will appreciate it for as long as it lasts, Erica. I tell you what, there is a. I do think that there will be a time in the future that we all have conversations about how lucky we were to get to see this unfold. Uh, we're all very proud of you, and, and you're an incredible ambassador for the sport of drag racing, and God only knows where this whole deal would be without you. So uh, from your mouth to God's ears, I hope we keep you here for, for quite a while. So Erica, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I hope you get to enjoy some time off. Will we see you? I'm sure there's no chance we're going to get Richard to the party next Thursday night, but will will you be there? Um, yes, I told Royce Lee that's his job, that he is to reiterate to Richard and the guys that we have a VIP table. There will be a place to sit down. You don't have to wait in line for drinks because Richard Freeman is not going anywhere that he's not special. So um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. A lot of all of us feel that way. But um, yes, we're making an appearance. I know my sister posted about it. We're really excited and we can't thank you enough for, for all that you do there, of course, and for our sport of drag racing and how much you believe in me. So I appreciate all of that. And you know, we're excited about, about the future. There's some more announcements coming up at PRI, so we're excited about that as well. And I'll be making an appearance at the Melling booth at C-Tech Manufacturing. I'll be at Racing Radio. So we'll be we'll be running all across that convention center, and we're looking forward to it. But um, again, Wes, I appreciate you so much. Stick, you know, stick around for just a second, Erica, here, and uh, help us oh. introduce the, our next guest. Good oh, you got your Jordans on? I got to ask. You about to dunk on somebody? Yes. I mean, come on. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> He's got him on. I got him on. Always. But, so uh, who do you got? Who, who are you going to bring on, T? We, we, she was just talking about him, Matt and Angie okay. Smith. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, fresh off a sixth NHRA Pro Stock Motorcycle World Championship and also winning the NHRA Finals in Pomona, the husband-wife team, I think... Like maybe like the first husband and wife of drag racing. Like this is a really powerful thing. The one and only Matt and Angie Smith. Hi. Hi, Erica. Oh yeah. He's a Christmas card. Hi. Hi, Wes. Hi, Erica. Hey, Matt. What's going on? <laughs> hey, Erica, you well, did say something right. You said Richard is special. That is for sure. <laughs> He's so special. Are you. Yes. <laughs> so are you. <laughs> he he can't go anywhere without like he, I remember one time telling what did I tell him that like hey we should go to Mexico sometime or whatever he's like Pfft, I ain't going to Me everybody goes to Mexico I ain't going to Mexico that's just where everybody goes on vacation he was twirling his deal you know like which is about to have its own zip code like, <laughs> yeah, it's that, huge right? it's it's <laughs> unbelievable so what are you guys doing uh, JT likes to bring you guys all on at once. Um, and get this weird moment that we don't rarely see where all of you guys are talking at the same time. Because we always get to see like Erica by herself, Angie by herself, Matt by himself. Um, so let's just run around the room real quick. W what was it like to all be in the winner's circle and celebrating in Pomona together, knowing that you guys all have history? You, you uh, Elite is involved with your engine program on the motorcycles. Uh, Angie and Erica, I know you guys are close. Uh, what's it like when it, the stars and moon align and you guys are all sharing in a moment like that. It's a fairy tale day. I mean, when me and Erica can be in the winter circle together, that's that's all we want. I mean, we don't care really care about anybody else. No, I'm just kidding, Matt. But, <laughs> um, I mean, we have such a connection, and she truly was my motivation all day on Sunday at Pomona because, as you know, uh, all of us racers. I mean, maybe not Matt, because I don't know who's a different breed, but we 
we dream about the, we dream up this self doubt that we have, and we're like, are we gonna do it? Like, you know, I don't want to go up there and be a slacker and all of this. And she, her, and Courtney were truly my motivation because I don't even know that I could have gotten through Pomona without them because. They just kept telling me, you got this, you got this, you can do it, you got this, you got to believe it. And like, I needed that so bad because I was, I think, more nervous for Matt winning his sixth championship than I was worried about me racing. I mean, because I just didn't want something stupid to happen. And so I was, you know, out of control, stressed about that. And I wasn't even worried about myself racing. And then me and Erica and Courtney had a conversation about it. And they just kept telling me, believe in it. Every round they come up there, believe in it. You can do it. You got this. And I turned four wind lights on. And like I said in my interview at the end of the track, you know, I owe it to her because, like, she was my motivational speech all day that day. I mean, Matt, you were too. You were too. <laughs> but, like, just to hear it from another female and, you know, us females, we, we drum up all this other stuff that goes on in our life. So... Wait, Erica, well, what's Erica. that mean? What's that like to hear that? I mean, like, holy moly, I feel like we just had like a little bit of a moment here. Um, <laughs> and maybe we need to all hold hands or something. I don't know. But that was what's that feel like to hear that? I mean, do you ever imagine having that kind of an impact on a fellow racer? Um, it means the world to me. I, I'm not a crier, but like a little tear right there. But um, Angie's my girl and we've been pretty close for for quite some time now. And as you mentioned, Elite does some stuff with with Matt Smith, Smith Racing and, and their engine program. So we're excited to all be all be teammates and a part of it. But beyond that, um, our friendship is the most important thing. And um, as I mentioned in our interview just a few minutes ago, Wes, how, how proud I am of Angie because of, you know, the road that she's taken, she's earned all of this and she's battled through a lot of crap. And while I deal with Rich Freeman, she deals with Matt Smith. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's all in good fun, but I'm, I'm really proud of her and she's, she's dug deep and she's executed perfectly and being able to win together in, uh, in Las Vegas for our first time together was so meaningful. And had I not screwed it up on Sunday in Pomona, we would have done it again, but being able to watch her out of the windshield in my pro stock car before I fire up and pull into the water box and see her turn that, that fourth round beacon on was so exciting for me. And I'm like, I just got to do my job now. I, I failed that one particular race, but I'm so proud of you, Angie. You, you're a tremendous rider. You really come into your own and you've worked so hard for it. And that's what, that's what I love about it is the hard work. You don't just, you don't just write a check and show up with your helmet like a lot of people do. And and that's what's uh, super cool about it. So thank you for all the kind words. They mean so much to me. Well, thank well, you. We won your championship. So none of us failed at this at all. We all got to stand up there together. We did. Well, and, our, and our other partner in this relationship is Mark Stockseth, yep. who actually, he owns Erica's car. He owns, you know, my bike. And, uh, you know, in 2020, we won our fourth championship, and Erica won her fourth championship together. So he had a special ring made with both of us on on a, on a ring. And um, you know, it's Mark badass. is a a really really good guy, and he helps both our teams a uh, tremendously amount. A dude he really that, does. Like contributes a tremendous amount to the sport. I have this funny story where whenever NHRA was getting like really aggressive promoting NHRA.tv a few seasons ago, like before COVID, um, and they were really pushing it. It was like a hundred bucks or whatever. Mark called me out of the clear blue and he's like, Hey man, I really like your show you do. What if I buy like 50 or a hundred of those things? And I'm like, uh-huh. And he's like, and then you just give them away. And I'm like, just give away. What do you mean? And he's he's like, well, literally, I'll just I'll buy 50 or a hundred you know, passes to NHRA.TV and you can just give them to folks that watch your show. And I'm like, are you serious? And the NHRA, when I called them, they didn't even know how to do it. They're like, wait, <laughs> how many do you want to buy? And I'm like, like, he wants to buy like a hundred, you know? So it's what a great ambassador for the sport of drag racing. E, we'll let you go. Thank you so much for spending some time with us on a Wednesday afternoon. We'll see you <laughs> in Indianapolis next week, okay? Okay, sounds awesome. Thanks, guys. Bye, Matt and Angie. Thanks, Bye. Erica. Thank you, Indy. Okay, guys. Um, well, last time we tried to do this, Matt and Angie, you guys were driving across the country, and I think that that's where I want to start because six world championships, Matt, there's all the success that you're having, Angie, and then driving the truck. You guys are uh, – we posted a, a quote on social earlier in the week. Were you talking about, Matt, the effort that goes in in the off offseason? Uh, it, it's no secret that the Smith family, these are some folks that are not afraid of hard work, but can you just kind of – 
take us through some of that, the grind that this is? I mean, this isn't always a glamorous thing. It's glamorous in those moments on the stage, right? And it's glamorous at those sponsor dinners with Lisa and the team at Denso. But there's a whole lot of not so glamorous moments that aren't captured by the cameras. I mean, what's it feel like to go through all that work? Feel free to describe some of it to us and some of those challenges, but then be rewarded at the end of it with wins and championships. Yeah. I mean, basically up until this year, it's just been me and Angie in the shop working full time. And we've accomplished all this stuff with just me and her in here. We used to have two guys that flew in and flew out to every race. But when it comes to working in the shop, you know, most you, we do more work in the off season than we do during the regular season because you got to find power on the dyno to be able to go run fast to make yourself look good in the in, during race season. You can't R and D during race season. It, it just it doesn't work like that. So all your effort and all your time goes into doing it during the off season, which is December, January, and February for us. Um, but this year we got to hire Nate um, Kendrick. He's full time here, and he's helped me a bunch because it's taken a lot of load off me. Um, of doing a lot of stuff in, in the in the shop here so I can study runs and I can do some more stuff and do some more R&D stuff of ordering parts and designing stuff so I can get stuff made. Um, so that's been a tremendous help this year. And, and, and the Scrappers team is what's allowed us to do that because they're the ones that's, that's paying Nate to drive their truck and trailer across the country for Gianna, but he works here in the shop full time for us. So that's that's been a big help to us, you know, this year and, and the years coming, you know. What do you guys make of the the lay of the land in Pro Stock Motorcycle right now? Like um, you guys had a, an incredible season, obviously just just missed a one two finish. Um, but you finished a career best third in points, Angie. But there was an interesting stat that uh, Josh Hatchett with NHRA was, sh- was shared with us. That was you never qualified uh, lower than seventh. I mean, you had a top half bike all year long, which sometimes I think is worth noting or, and kind of worth celebrating, especially from the team owner perspective, because you see it frequently where like the main guys, his shit's always fast, right? But <laughs> everybody else, you know, you never know, but to be, you're not only is Angie's bike competitive, but everything you touch is competitive. Matt, how proud of you guys? Let's get Angie. What, how proud of Matt and the team that you guys have assembled? I mean, you just heard him, Angie, like, Uh, It's just you two to be able to have that kind of involvement with so many people's success. That's got to feel good. Oh, it feels tremendous. And like you said, we do work sun up to sundown. And, you know, it's if you got to put in 12, 18, 15 hours a day, if you got to put all that work in to get the results, that's what you have to do. And, you know, we have jumped through all the hoops and we have had the moments where, We've had to come home from a race and tear six motors apart and go to the next race the next weekend and get four hours of sleep every night. And, you know, we've done that. And I think we have worked really hard on our program to make it have a stable program. And now, you know, we have Nate in the shop, which is a big help to us. And now I just think we're reaping the benefits of all of that stuff you know, we still work day in and day out. And, and I think with it just being us three in the shop, we keep our secrets to ourselves. You know, we keep our confidentiality parts to us. And I think that's another reason why we're very successful. We don't sell motors to anybody. We don't do any of that stuff because we want to go fast and we want to be successful. I was very proud of that stat. And I, we were talking, me and Matt were talking on our 41 hour drive on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking. And so you can talk about a lot of things. And I told him, I said, I think I did qualify in the top half of, of every race this year. And I did. And, you know, that's, it might not be an accomplishment to somebody else, but it's an accomplishment to me because it's huge. It's I hard. mean, that is it's bonkers. Out there. Yeah. It's hard. I mean, it, I think about folks that, and we we were having this conversation a little bit with Erica, like how big of a deal, it's hard to win four games of tic-tac-toe in a row, like unless you're playing against your kid, you know? And it's, I mean, to think about stringing four win lights together at the NHRA finals in Pomona in front of all these people, the rat last race of the year with all these other implications and what's going to happen with this deal and what's going to happen with that relationship and this sponsor to be able to rise to the occasion so frequently as you two do 
it's a really incredible thing. Matt, six world championships. I mean, I know you and your pops. I mean, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You're clearly a fiercely competitive individual. But did was it ever on your radar to achieve success at this level? Did you ever think this was possible? No. I mean, when me and Mark Stock says started this deal together in 2007, we just wanted to win a race together. And, and you know, that was our main goal. Just when you go to NHRA for the first time, you just want to win a race. And our first year out together, we won four races and the championship. And we're like, wow, this is, this is cool. You know, why didn't we do this sooner? <laughs> and, you know, and now we strung six championships together with me and Mark. You know, he's the only one besides Angie that's been with me from the word go. You know, sponsors come and go and all this stuff. But we've got a very, very good sponsor now with Denzo. And I think that's why we strung three championships in a row together because Denzo has been on board with me for the last four years. So when you know you have a good sponsor behind you, you can put forth the more and more money over the off season because you know you got the funding to go next year and you can find stuff. You can find power and you work at stuff. And and, and not all R&D stuff, you know, you find power. Sometimes you go backwards. Well, you just throw that stuff away. You don't sell it to nobody. You just throw it away. So that's that's where you know you you've got to have the good sponsors to be able to do this and and we are lucky to have Denzel on board with us and uh man i mean in my opinion i tied in my opinion the greatest drag racer of all time which i consider dave schultz i know i tied andrew hines you know also but even andrew probably looked up to dave schultz because this is a guy that was racing long before we ever thought about racing and for, for him to tie him back in the days that he did, and now for me to tie both of them, I mean, it's just huge for me because, I mean, I just I put my names up there with, I think, the greatest the rider of all time. And, and Andrew is probably, I would say right now, Andrew's probably the greatest rider of all time because he has, I'm looking at the sheets now, he has more wins than anybody else in our class, even more than Dave Schultz, and he has more, he has the, the same amount of championships as Dave Schultz. So, in my opinion... Andrew Hines is the greatest rider of all time right now in our class, you know. Wow. Those are big words, man. And I, that, that's honestly not what I expected you to, to say. Like, um, but that, that's very interesting. And it's cool to see like, like that level of success. You touched on a bunch of stuff there that I think is so important. I mean, we got to give it up to because there's there are a handful of sponsors that are like have stood the test of time in our space. Like these long lasting relationships are few and far between. So like Lisa Mickler and the team at Denso, like I think it's incredible the 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 commitment they've made to you guys and that's what drag racing needs more of is partners that are that see an opportunity here to generate an ROI to to make money to yeah. to make the most of it but are willing to be active participants i see her on the starting line waving a freaking denzo flag and losing her mind and all these things and drag racing needs more of that more people because i think a lot of times the notion is like hey we're going to give these people some money and they're going to go out to the racetrack and they're going to fly our flag or whatever but we've found at Drag Illustrated, unless there is someone involved in the program that is passionate about it, it's yep. almost always destined to fail. Yep. Like if it's just a business relationship, if it is just some exchanging of money for decals or money for visibility, very rarely do those relationships last a long time. But when there's someone like Lisa, there's a several of them that come to mind. I always think of like Woody Woodruff and Jags. Like yep. he was the guy. You know, he would sponsor, you know, Jegs would sponsor a, an event or sponsor a car or whatever, but Woody was the guy that was there making shit happen, connecting the dots, putting people together, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it, I'm glad that you guys have a partner like that that is is supporting you guys to the level that they do. When you guys look forward, I mean, what's the next chapter for Matt Smith and, and, and Angie Smith? I mean, we've got championships you got more trophies than you've got room for yes. are you guys leaning into this team ownership kind of because it feels like an elite motorsports richard freeman situation is brewing where you're about to have your hand on a slew of these things well we've talked about it and you know i i'm not ready to quit driving myself yet um but if we have the right amount of money from other riders coming in and want to rent bikes and 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 do this yeah, I would gladly step aside, you know, at some point and and just field bikes, you know. Angie's still got a lot of years to go. So, you know, I, I want her to to be I mean, well, you're 41, I'm 50, you know. It's there's uh, I would like to go That's four not more correct, years. But anyway. Well, she's 39. 
Yeah. Forever. She's she's not that, but anyway, <laughs> I, I would still, you know, I would like to go four more years, maybe five more years, and then, you know, let me be a team owner. Let let people come in here and ride these bikes and, and do good. But, you know, and that's that's kind of where we're at with Gianna. I mean, we are here to make her better. And I think it showed this year, ever since I took that program over, she became a better rider each and every race and really got more confident around the indie time. You know, the wreck in December really set us back with her. When when the front end broke at, at Bradenton testing, uh, that set us back, you know, majorly. She didn't even run the first three or four races of the year because she was still, the doctor would not release her. She had a, I mean, uh, she had a bad concussion. And yeah. You know, and, and it just, they wouldn't release her. And, and nobody really knew the story of that. But, you know, I can uh, uh, evaluate the story just a little bit real quick. But the front end broke on the bike and it wasn't anybody's fault, but just it shouldn't have been on the bike in the first place. And we had just taken over all the stuff and we didn't check all that stuff really. We just, we looked at all the stuff and we needed to go test with her to be sure let's make the corrections of what's going on with her bike and try to help her. And we didn't check over the bike like we should have. And, and, and I'll take blame for that. But um, at the Bradenton test, it broke. And the bad part was there was no ambulance there. And she laid on that track for 45 minutes, basically didn't know where she's at, unconscious, bleeding. And it's a scary deal. And, and in my opinion, all these tracks should have an ambulance on, on, on site at all times. And I've stressed that to Bradenton that anytime people test, you know, they pay the money to test. If you got up to any 500, 6 more hundred dollars to get an ambulance there, it needs to be there because anything can happen. And, and this was something that could have turned a lot worse than it did. So luckily, she's all right. She come back this year, had a good year. And I really see us excelling with her more and more this year. And, and our goal is to have her in the top 10 in points by the end of the year. It felt like at the end of the season, she was like she'd gotten her confidence back, like because yep. I'm sure that is a spirit breaking moment. Right. I mean, in those moments, she's, you know, fought the thing before and to see I'm sure that was a tremendous setback. But you guys rallying around her the way that you have. I think it's made a big difference because you can see it in how she handles herself at the track, the way she handles interviews, all those things is that she's kind of got some pep in her step again. She believes in herself again, and she's obviously got equipment that can make, you know, take her to the promised land. So is that how many bikes will you guys be fielding in 2023? Have you guys like kind of evaluated where you're at on that or who all is going to be in what spot? Um, as it stands right now, we are going to be I'm going to be on. I'm going to be on the Suzuki, the Denso okay. Suzuki. Uh, Angie's going to be on the Denso uh, V Twin, and Gianna. We don't know sponsorship wise, but you know she's going to be on her Suzuki right now. Um, we will bring Chip out occasionally, um, every now and then, to do some testing for us, um, uh, either on a Suzuki or a V Twin. We don't know that, but that's our status right now, uh, going forward until you know. We know otherwise, but that's that's our goal right now is to fill three bikes full time, a fourth bike every now and then. And uh, that's where we're going to be at next year. Does it is it it seems like it could be from the outside looking in. It's curious because I liken this to a pro mod team having a nitrous car and a blower car. Right. Or a, or a pro stock team having a Ford and a Chevy. Um, we know that ship's pretty much sailed. But is that. Can that can the Suzuki versus V twin thing is that a can that be a problematic scenario, Matt? Like, do you ever fight the the notion of like, all right, we don't need that distracting us, um, or or how do you look at that? Because I can see some people going, wow, man, it doesn't make any sense at all to be even tinkering with something else when you've had all the success that you have had with the V twin. Yeah, but here's the thing. So we'll, we'll bring this up right now. <laughs> NHRA wants Suzuki to win a championship. All right, plain and simple. They pushed really hard this year for a Suzuki bike to win that championship. They are the. Do Suzuki you is that true? Yes, yeah, Suzuki. Like, really? Like that's a thing? Okay, okay so I'm going I'm to tell you something here. <laughs> Suzuki is the official bike. We're about of to NHRA. get some shit start up. Yes, is what we're about to do. Okay, about to go ahead. So Suzuki is the official bike of NHRA. You know, since Harley they didn't give left, me one. did they give you one? No, no, because I'm on a V twin. Okay. That's why, I, park, that's why I built a Suzuki, so hopefully they'd give me one, but they still haven't. I'm still waiting. Shit. Um, but anyway, they want a Suzuki to win. All right. <laughs> Rule change came out last week. Last week. 
last week. Now, Suzuki was number one qualifier at Pomona. Suzuki was the quickest bike almost every round of Pomona. Angie won on a whole shot. Joey outran her, but she won on a whole shot. And they got a real shame. What what happened? Oh, let's take five more pounds off the of Suzuki. We need them to be a more dominant bike than what they already are. So here, here here's the next step. Angel went four hundredths under the nat, under the track record at Pomona, but yet they're still gonna get weight off of them. <laughs> Makes no sense in the world to me. Have no so clue. they're like not conversations that have like, do you call somebody and go, hey, this this is a tough one. Like, what, what why is this happening? Because can anybody back that up? Because no. okay, they, they they cannot give us the facts of why they do some of the stupid stuff that they do. All right, plain and simple. We've asked for a formula. Everybody knows that comp eliminator has a formula. If you go five tenths or you go six tenths, you go under, you're going to get hit with a penalty. All right. We've asked for a formula of how they determine these rule changes. They won't tell us because simple fact is I don't think they know. <laughs> I can tell you now, Buell doesn't write in HRA a check or the tech department a check. You know, Harley did. Why do you think the V twins got all these rules for all these years? Because Harley wrote, NHRA a check every year, a million dollars check to be on that midway. Now Suzuki's doing it. So who's getting the rules favored in their favor? That's why I'm going to be on a Suzuki. That's why I built one this year to do some learning, to do some testing. And I got it fast. It's fast. I can promise you if I get my bike to go to 330, like Vance and Hines got on Joe's bike to go to 330, I'm going to dominate next year with it. <laughs> All right. Promise you that. So I'm making that call right now. I'm calling my shot. I'm like Babe Ruth. I'm calling my shot. If I can, if I can 330 like Angel's bike did, I'm going to win this championship next year on a Suzuki. And then I'll see what NHRA does. <laughs> well, okay then. Uh, that, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I tell you, I, you hear a lot about that, like formulaic thing, like the comp eliminator. There's supposedly a, a similar situation with ProMod where like they put all the runs in and they've got a spreadsheet and it, it cranks like if there's this much disparity, then it, it triggers a review and then they're going to make a decision. But that really is kind of hard to wrap your head around um, taking weight off the, the fastest bike on the yeah. property. Yeah. yeah. It's a little bit of a difficult thing. <laughs> is that what, I mean, where do you guys feel like you stand in the lay of the land with, cause I felt like pro stock bike this season, pro stock motorcycle was more of the conversation. And I don't know why that was, uh, or what's happened, but I do feel like, you know, we've, we, NHRA does a lot of shit wrong. There's no doubt about it, but they do do some things right. Um, and I think that they set the standard in drag racing. You know I mean? You go to any event, I mean, you talk about test sessions or anything. Everybody goes, well, I wish they did it like NHRA does. I wish they did. It. I wish they had the schedule like NHRA. I wish the track was as consistent as NHRA. I wish this, that, and the other was like NHRA. Um, one of the things that I think they did extremely well in 2022 was make sure that Pro Stock Motorcycle was was guilty by association. You guys weren't treated like a secondary class. You guys weren't on a different stage. And I think it's really an incredible thing to see, you know, Matt, you standing alongside Erica and Brittany and, and Ron Caps, and you having those moments as well, Angie, where you're guilty by association with the top classes in NHRA. Did you guys feel that? Do you, have you felt that shift? Uh, and what do you think's driving it? I mean, I think they did a great job. And, you know, and, hats off to Lisa and Denzo because they come up with a plan to put the onboard cameras on our bikes. So when, when it was on Fox, you know, they always showed either Matt's onboard camera and my onboard camera. So we got a lot more TV time as well. And I just think that our motorcycle drag racing has, is more competitive. Now we're more, we're gravitating towards what pro stock is from top to bottom in qualifying. And that is what drums up excitement. And you have a lot of riders fighting now, fighting for those top spots. It's it's fun to watch. And I'm glad to see you guys get your moment in the sun. And it's, it's it, you, Matt, you've had it for a long time, but it did feel like this year just seemed different. You know, like I felt like the pageantry was there, that people were excited, the NHRA, you know, th they, were, they were rallying around you and accepting you for the champion that you are and a fantastic ambassador for the sport. Two closing things because I don't know shit about running a, a pro stock motorcycle. What is like the launch RPM on one of those things typically? Well, mine is about... 
ish, right? <laughs> yep. Yep. And does it dis- what's the difference between a heart like a V twin and a Suzuki on the starting line RPM launch RPM wise? Significant? No. So I'm leaving on the Suzuki around 6,500 RPM, okay. and the V twins around 62, 6,300 RPM. Okay. What so, do you shift them at? The RPMs is what's the big difference. What do yeah. you shift them at? So the Suzuki you want to shift about 13.7, 13.8, wow. and and the and the V twin. Um, <laughs> Gen one. <laughs> I knew this was coming. I knew it was about to happen. You can be rough. You don't have to be exact. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So that that's significant. Like that, I'm not. I mean, I'm not at all surprised. But it is kind of cool to hear. Um, does is the Suzuki any more difficult on the gear change? Is it more finicky? Um, because when you're spinning something almost fourteen thousand RPM, it, is it? more i mean we do see that i felt like a lot this year with car bikes not going into the next gear transmissions breaking things like that when the rpms get that high is it considerably more difficult no i don't think so i think the biggest thing is uh, all your suzuki guys all all the the people that wrote ride them and even me when i wrote them we run the the pro stop motorcycle has two fuels um and i disagree with this too uh i think we should have one one fuel just like pro stock car, we all were on this, this gas from Sunoco is called SR 18. And, uh, I think it was last year, maybe the year before, um, one of the, the Suzuki groups got with NHRA and Sunoco and got them to make a special fuel for the Suzuki guys. And I didn't see where it really helped them at that point. Hmm. It's when they got the four valve motor is when it really, they started stepping up. Um, I wish we'd go back to the yellow fuel, which is SR18, because the new one is called Cyclone 17. Hmm. Um, to me, it, it's it's it has like a little bit of oxygenated in it, so but it's very volatile. I've seen it where it gets when it gets hot outside, it doesn't react right, and it it changes your tune up dramatically. Where the SR18 just stays consistent, whether it's cool air or or good air, you know, hot air, it's it's the same. But I've seen the red fuel, and I think that's why you see the fluctuation so much of the Suzuki bikes right now because they're all running a red fuel. A1 because it makes more power, and if you hit everything right, it's going to run faster. But I think we should all be on the yellow fuel because I think everybody's tune-ups will get a lot better and more consistent uh, with the yellow fuel. And is that's that my something p- that you think can happen? Like, is that a rule that you you think could ever come to be? Because it does seem to work well in pro stock. Yeah, and I, and I think they should take that back away. Um, we are going to focus a lot on the yellow fuel this winter, uh, doing some testing and running on the dyno because, with the Suzuki program because I want to show an HRA, hey, this is the fuel that we need to be running. This is the fuel that will make you go fast and be more consistent on a consistent basis because that was one of the things that I saw with Suzuki. It's so inconsistent, and I don't know if it – I think it's the fuel that's making the bikes really inconsistent with timing and, and jetting and all that. Does it matter? Does do they fill your bikes up for you, like the, or is it you just go pick up your fuel? No, normally you'll go pick your fuel up at the at the Sunoco truck, right. you know, at the beginning of the weekend. But the last five six race of year, NHRA, somebody was paying NHRA to fill our bikes up in the staging lanes. Do you like that? I kind of like that, to be honest. Like, I mean, I would like it better if it was all one fuel. But yeah. for me, I almost think that there's a marketing thing that can be done there because it's. Like the cameras should be filming that because it's like you're getting your allotment and like this shit is so high end and volatile that we need to like, that's how I would do it. I'd be like, all right, we're going to film the, the it's going to be the whatever Red Bull race fuel cam or whatever. And we're going to bring everybody up here and fill them up because I think there's some pageantry that can be had with that. Um, but it does seem like it it just kind of nips that whole situated situation in the bud because is like cooling a fu- the fuel and all that stuff prevalent in pro stock motorcycle? Do you do do people do that? No, you're not allowed to have cooling, okay. um, you know, devices on the bike to cool the fuel. And most time with you know, and at the end of the run, NHRA always checks your fuel after every pass. So right. you know, it has to pass the the temperature test and it has to pass the Pacific gravity test. Um, so you know. Fuel injection that circulates through, so it's going to get warmer gradually going right. down the track because it's going through a pump. So there's no benefit to us doing that stuff. You know, um, I don't mind them filling us in the in the staging lanes, but it takes two people with NHRA, sure. so that's two more people that NHRA has to put up there oh, yeah. to do work. You know, so and that's the only thing that I see that 
is the, the only downside. To it. Yeah, yes. the only downside. Well, guys, thank you so much for spending some time with us on a Wednesday afternoon. Um, I hope will we see you at the PRI show next week. We'll be there. Okay, so this is my Matt Smith story. Okay, this is good. He turned fifty this year, and I'm taking. Um, he wanted to go on a cruise, so. And all of our Disney. Of our friends. Are you guys going to do a Disney cruise? Are you going <laughs> to yes. get to meet some characters? No, I'm just Lisa joking. Lisa and Brian are going because it's, oh, cool. um, it's Brian's 50th birthday as well. Matt's 50th birthday. So we're celebrating all the, all the men. So Matt has to work all the time anyway. And he's going to take seven days off and go on this cruise. So we are literally flying in Wednesday night, going to the PRI show, and then coming straight home because he has to fulfill them hours that he's going to be gone. So he has to put those hours back in at the shop. So I yeah. get it. And we have a sponsor obligation with Lucas Oil up there Thursday. So we're going to do that. And, you know, anybody else that wants us Thursday will be there, but we're jetting out after that. All right, well, come hang out with us in the Drag Illustrated booth. Congratulations, you guys. We're super proud of you, um, and we couldn't get any more lucky to have you guys as ambassadors for the sport. So enjoy the holidays, and we'll see you at least for a day or so at PRI next week, all right? Thanks, thank Wes. You, Wes, and thank Thanks, you for everything guys. you do for us because oh, hush. you love drag racing as much as all of us. Well, we're trying, but we're trying. I promise. You guys keep doing burnouts and winning championships. We'll keep telling the world about it. Fair enough? All right. All right. Thank you. All right, guys. Take care. Thank you. Yeah. Guys, I want to remind you all that each and every episode of The West Buck Show is brought to you by way of our friends at FlowRacing.com. If you're a drag racer or a drag racing fan, you got to get on board with Flow Racing, the world leader in sports live streaming. Flow Racing provides unlimited access to drag racing's biggest events like Donald Long's Lights Out, No Mercy, and Sweet 16, every stop on the PDRA and NMCA Tour, Funny Car Chaos, World Cup Finals, Streetcar Super Nationals, this coming weekend's Snowbird Outlaw Nationals at Bradenton Motorsports Park, and much, much more. The platform provided by Flow Racing is changing drag racing for the better, and there's no limit to the good they can do here. So log on to www.flowracing.com today and join the movement. Mike, um, I think we lost JT there amidst uh, something. He was getting sick or something, right? No, his, uh, the flu's been running through his house, so he <sighs> had to get home to a sick kid. So yeah. we, we, we let him off this one. Was time. he okay? Yeah, he I has been worried like to death that he's going to be too sick to go to PRI oh, or no. something's going to happen. Oh, boy. Yeah, Ho hopefully it's over before then. But Yeah, I hope so, too. Man, yeah. Matt and Angie, they're, that's, they're awesome. And they're you, something you, else. I don't know if any, we talked about it before the video, the, the uh, parody video that Amanda music did with, with where she played both of them. Oh. I thought that was, that was one of the best pieces of content that I've seen put together in recent years. Um, but we were, we were talking about what's Erica's uh, what's her, what's her theme or her slogan going to be as she goes for six. Well, Matt had it or Amanda came up with it in that video in the mix for six. In the mix for six. Yep. I like, we need to write that shit yep. down because yep. that, so. that's going to stick. That'll be a t shirt. Yep. Um, how about the, I love Matt has, he gives zero. This oh, is that how was, many I, I was pretty sure. I, I had to like wipe my eyes a little bit. I thought that was Ricky Smith that had jumped on here because when you get, when you get a Smith on here, we're going to talk some rules and we're, because they are always chipping away Ooh. and beating up the rule can I, can I tell a secret? Okay, so this is true story. But that's part of their that's that's part of what it makes is. them successful. They're always looking for you know where they where they can find the advantage in working on those rules. I love Ricky Smith. I mean, I really do. He may not believe me, but I really like I would give him anything I have. Like I we've we've been at odds at times in the past or whatever but like i love the guy and uh it's so funny because as is well i hope hopefully well known there's a major uh drag racing happening coming up next spring march 3rd 4th and 5th at Bradenton motorsports park that will oh, yeah. change the sport of drag racing forever um the world series of pro mod as i've been calling and inviting folks um i think i've invited i've made a lot of calls let's just say um more than 30 uh, calls to racers and most of them last about three to uh, let's say five to seven minutes. Right. Um, it, I call someone up, Jason Scruggs, like, Hey man, I got this idea. I'm putting on this hundred thousand win, uh, pro mod race. Uh, I want you to be there. It's invite only blah, 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 blah. And I mean, normally I don't even get my, my pitch finished and they're like, yep, I'm in lock it in. I'm there. He's got to get, get back to the field, man. It's harvest, right? He's busy. 
my call with Ricky was an hour and 40 minutes. He's going to use and that it, opportunity to work on you. Oh my goodness, man. It was like, I told him, I said, well, so what do you say, Ricky? You want to come down to Bradenton March 3rd, 4th, and 5th and run at the biggest, richest pro mod drag race in the history of the known universe? You, you want a piece of this action? You want some of this smoke? And he goes, oh, Wes, <laughs> buddy, I, I, I want to say yes. What are we going to do on these nitrous rules? And I'm like, God, <laughs> I told you when you, you said yes, you were getting bro. ready to invite Ricky. I was like, well, just be prepared to hear almost about the rules. two hours. I had mistakenly told Alicia and my wife that we were going to go for dinner. I said, hey, we'll go as soon as I get done with this deal with Ricky. And so she keeps coming to my office and she's like, are you still on the phone? I'm like, yeah, I hold it up. It's like Ricky Smith. Have you ever talked to him? This takes a while. Like, I mean, we, we cry. I mean, we cried together a couple of times. Uh, we talked about retiring a couple of times. Um, we talked about family and friends and wrestling bears and, um, I mean, all sorts of stuff. And he's I mean, a, we both got choked up guy. at different times, but man, it was a, a wild, wild deal. Uh, yeah. what, what Matt deal doesn't there? fall far from the tree. I can't believe Matt's 50 because I don't know exactly how old Ricky is. Ricky must have, they, that well, Matt, he was born on Christmas. He was Matt born came on along, December Matt 25th. came along uh, pretty pretty quickly there after yeah after Ricky and uh, and his wife got married. It so does I, seem I fitting that, that Jesus that Christ and Ricky Smith share a birthday. Yeah, you know, I didn't realize they were that that close in age. I really didn't. Because Jesus it, and Rich, Ricky? No, Matt. Oh, and Ricky. no, I'm just joking. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it is funny that his birthday's on the 25th though, right? His birthday's on Christmas. <laughs> that is funny. That is pretty I think funny. It's funny. Ricky's, Ricky's 68, 68 or 69. Or 69. Okay. Okay. Um too much Which, pro mod bullshit it, says Tom it, Craig. Angie is in here. Angie telling the story about Matt not being able to go on this cruise or, and PRI because he's he's got to work. I can vouch for that because we had an invitation to go hang out and eat dinner with Eric Trump. At, at a at one of his rallies uh, when Donald was running for re-election, and Angie came, Angie was invited, and Matt was invited, but Matt couldn't go because he was <laughs> Dino and Motors. So Matt, you know, you got a once in a lifetime opportunity here to to do this uh, deal, uh, and he was like, "You go ahead, I got to Dino these motors." So again, uh, the work ethic, the the uh, you know, working the rules and working every angle. That's what you got to do to be successful. And it shows with both of them. It's crazy that it, it really is. That's what's required at this point in time. There are days that I'm fearful of how competitive drag racing has gotten, but it feels like the yin, the yin is starting to finally match the yang. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it, it's taken this level of work. It's taken this level of money, but it does feel like the other side of it, like the spoils, the exposure, the sponsorship opportunities, the, the merch sales, like the other things are starting to match it. And that's really, really important. And that's where this whole thing really needs to get is where the effort and the energy and the money resources, et cetera, that are required to be successful in pro level drag racing. Are, we need that investment to be worth it. And I think we are rapidly as a sport trending in that direction. A um, couple of closing notes, uh, Paul Kurtz in the comments here asking uh, about Canadians making travel plans to the world series of pro mod tickets will go on sale this week. Um, I, I believe we will launch ticket sales on Friday. That will include a VIP ticket offering. That will be a really, really cool experience for folks. Um, all sorts of things, major, major announcements coming in the, in the next couple of weeks that I'm very excited about. So, uh, stay tuned to drag illustrated and drag illustrated.com because we will be rolling out these announcements one after another. We will announce yet another driver in about 40 minutes here on the, the drag illustrated. We've Facebook had some good page. announcements this week, man. Alex Laughlin. Yeah. Who's let's let's big, go through a few of those. Big money, quick. Alex. Anytime we have one of these big money races or anyone does, Alex is a threat. We've got Craig Sullivan in the el mero mero i think if you build a car like that that's an almost an automatic invite right to I be mean, honest with you it, it certainly makes a difference because we that's what that's what we're preaching in here you know that's that's what we want to see we that's what we want to see in pro mod we need that kind of stuff and so that that always catches our eye well, what are some other ones we announced this week you know i think about things like that a lot because a person that's willing to invest the kind of money uh, that is required into building a pro mod and choosing to build a, a 49 mercury uh especially the way that one looks that's our kind of guy that's Crash the kind of people 
yeah, crash it, rebuild it. That's our kind of guy. And that's the type of people that we need involved in Pro Modified. And I think it's important to celebrate that and reward people that make those type of decisions. Because trust me, Craig Sullivan, pro, you know, could have built a late model Camaro. He could have fallen in line. He could have done what so many folks have done and, and perhaps given himself a little bit of competitive advantage. But no, he chose to do it his way. And that car speaks for him. And he's a great fit for the World Series of Pro Mod. He's also a great guy. Um, he's full of energy. He's an excitable dude. He's got a personality. He's got kind of a character, in my opinion. He's been so, following along with every announcement and commenting and congratulating people. Uh, I love that. I think his one word comment on everything is hero. He, he puts every one of these guys as his hero. So he was getting some of that love back when we announced him today. I agree. I was actually genuinely surprised uh, how well I, I keep track of silly things. And I like to see whose little graphic performs. And I was blown away at, at how well Craig Sullivan. There's been several real surprises. Um, Tido, Mark Wardhausen. Um, his really got a ton of play. And I think it's funny because a lot of the turbo flag flying the turbo flag. Um, and I think that that was, you know, just to be out, you know, be honest and transparent with folk. Um, you know, there's a lot of really good pro mods in the country. I, I would say there's about 200 really good pro mod cars in North America, maybe more, maybe less, but it's, it's around that number. And my, my, our list internally right now reflects 177 that have earned points in 2022. But I know that there's more than that when you start to think about Big Dog and all these other series that exist across uh, around throughout North America. But things like that, you know, fly in the turbo flag. Turbo Pro Mods are few and far between. It wasn't that long ago that, you know, I was on this show telling everybody that if we're not careful, they're all going to be Turbo Pro Mods. <laughs> right. uh, but, uh, you know, a few years later, they're nearly extinct, about to go the way of the dodo. And so when, you know, I saw the handful of them that exist and the ones that really run good. And then I think about the people involved, the storyline. And you Mark go way back. With him. You go just like the Mark, Mark Mickey story. That's you go way back. You have a unique appreciation for, for his career, which I think I most met people Mark in 2002 or three. Uh, I met Tito and Mark two, in 2002 or three. He's a chassis builder outside of Jefferson City, Missouri. Um, and he was racing a little nitrous uh, Chevy two wagon um, and dragon bumpers all over South Missouri. I watched him. He had an Aztec gold SN95 Mustang with a pro charge small block in it that he raced in true 10 five competition and had a ton of success with. And I've watched him move up the ranks. He he was deeply involved with Tim Slavens, the late Tim Slavens, who raced Outlaw 10.5, moved into Radio vs. the World, uh, ultimately dabbled in some Pro 275, but uh, and then had plans to race Pro Modified. And the fact that that car, it's Tim Slavens' maroon red, uh, that his best buddy and crew chief, Mark Wardenhausen, is driving it now. There's so many layers to that onion. That story needs to be a part of the World Series of Pro Mod. And he also, Mark, I don't want to embarrass him, but he sent me a text that I thought was really meaningful. I have to dig through these here for a second. But he goes, um, we've always been known as underdogs, and I see that I am going to certainly wear that uh wear that title at the World Series of Pro Mod when I see all these other people uh, that have been invited, but we're happy to be the underdog and, and you know, we're proud to, to fly that flag. And I think it's, I've told a lot of people about the World Series of Pro Mod. For me, this is like casting a movie mm -hmm. and there's not a single person that's on this list that I don't see in a specific role because if I had my way, they'd all win. If right. I if I could give them all $100,000, I would, I promise We're not you. just going down the list of the 40 quickest cars and just and choosing that. And we have these things in mind when we when we pick these guys. Yeah, it's like, okay, history. Um, yeah. How big of a needle mover are they right now? Um, one of the issues that I can tell that we're going to have um, is some people coming out of the woodwork. Uh, I've had racers reach out to me that I haven't seen race in a while, right? right? And I didn't even know they still had their stuff. Or the last time I talked to them, they'd sold everything and they were going fishing, right? Well, now that this deal's back, you know, they want involved and it's so flattering and I want them to be involved, but I know that the air of exclusivity is going to make the difference in this event. If it, I, I promise you, if we made it come one, come all, it, it would lose its buzz. It would ha it would maintain it for a minute, but as we got close to the event, there'd be people falling away, away left and right. And I'm asking for a serious commitment from these folks. I mean, it's like a sign a contract. I'm going to be there no matter what, come hell or high water. I got to buy another car. I got to build another car. I'm going to be there. And 
that's a pretty significant commitment for a lot of folks to make. And I recognize that. And that's why we had to start small. And I encourage anybody that's at all dis disappointed or waiting for their phone to ring or feeling like they're on the outside looking in, stay the course, man. The World Series of Pro Mod is not going anywhere. We have massive plans for, for uh, the future. I see this as the biggest thing in drag racing. That's my goal, personally. I, I will not rest until the World Series of Pro Mod is the most significant thing in drag racing. So give us some time, you know, bear with us a little bit. It's a process. These things I, I get, it's tough oftentimes when you're compared to sanctions and series that have been around for 70 years. You know what I mean? The NHRA has been around for 70 years. Give us a minute, right? <laughs> PDRA is celebrating their 10th season. Give us a minute. Everybody right? expects instant success and instant gratification. Erica talked about that in her inter interview. I think as a society, that's yeah. where we are. But even in drag racing, all the hard work that goes into this stuff, man, doesn't happen overnight. No, and it takes a minute and we have to we have to be as much as I like to, you know, start at the finish line, we have to give yeah, ourselves to. room to grow. Like we have to we have to give ourselves incremental milestones to reach and I want to have room to grow. Like I want it to be a big deal next year if we invite 50 cars. That's 10 new cars that are going to be there. Um, I want it to be a big deal if we start doing two events and all of a sudden instead of having 40 or 50 cars involved, we've got 100 or 90 or 100 involved. I don't know. But I'm not closing the door on any of that uh, and I think there's plenty of opportunity for it. I, I think that there's the enthusiasm, the interest is there. Uh, we just kind of got to crawl, walk, run, right? And and I hope everybody will uh, join yeah. us in that process. And we'll have some big announcements next week at the PRI show, like we said. And no show next week because we're going to be at PRI. Yes. Um, and then I think we'll maybe get maybe one or two more shows in before the end of the year. Then we're going to take some time off. So we're, we're wrapping up here, but we've got a lot to do and a lot of big, big announcements coming. We've got one coming next Thursday that will change everything. So brace yourself. A big one, guys. I'm very excited about it. A couple of huge names that are going to be dropped uh, in the next couple of, of days here. We are tiptoeing right up to uh we're we're a, we're certainly in the tough decision uh neighborhood as far as our invite list goes uh there's a whole lot of people that are still on our radar but we we uh yeah exciting times michael right yes exciting times when never dull moment in, wednesday yeah you get in on wednesday right yeah wednesday Late we all do six yeah. You know, like yes, yeah. I do that so I don't have to do any work or or help set up. Smart, yeah. very, very, very smart. We got a brand new booth. It's gonna be dope. Uh, Mike bang, Mike and Josh Dixon banged out all this killer artwork. Our new booth. Come by and see us. Um, seriously, man, it's gonna be cool. Like it's, uh, we went the route of art installment. It, that's kind of what we were going for. We wanted to show off some history, remind folks of how long Drag Illustrated has been around. So you get to see a whole bunch of old covers, uh, the very first cover of Drag Illustrated, the most recent cover and everything in between. So come see us at the PRI show next week. Uh, 2000, what is it? Starts on Thursday, December 8th, goes through Saturday the 10th. We'd love to see you. Of course, Drag Illustrated After Hours coming up Thursday night, powered by VP Racing Fuels at NV Nightclub on Meridian Street in downtown Indianapolis. Mike, thanks a bunch, dude. I'll see yeah, you cats next week. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Let's shut her down. Boom, boom.